Okay, I will call the meeting to order at uh, 6.34 p.m. Um, I'll review the logistics. Anyone uh, joining us remotely, please change your name display to your uh, full first and last name. And when you're called upon to speak, please state your name and where you live. Uh, anyone who wishes to be recognized, please uh, use the uh, electronic uh, raise hand feature on on the Zoom function, so we uh, so we catch you and uh, get to hear from you. Um, <clears throat> if you're speaking about the specific agenda item, or for that matter, any time you're addressing the council, we ask you to keep your comments to three minutes, and Councillor Bate will help us. Uh, keep track of the time, and I think we're ready to go. First item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Any, yeah, I thought when we get to the, yeah. Uh, one thing I was going to suggest is uh, I item 15 on the agenda, which is to approve the contract for printing of the annual report. I would suggest we just move that to the consent agenda unless there's objection to that. Okay, we'll consider that done. Um, any other changes? Tim? I was going to take the home fire memorandum of understanding off the consent agenda just so we could hear a bit more about that. Sure. Um, and Carrie, did you want to mention your uh, item about the housing committee? Yeah, um, I'd like to request that the appointment to the housing committee. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. And with that, the agenda is approved. Um, next item on the agenda is general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on <clears throat> any topic which is not on tonight's agenda. Um, again, we ask you to uh, limit your comments to three minutes and we'll take people in the room and also uh, online. Well, starting with people in the room, is there anyone who'd like to be heard? John Snell. Very much, Mayor. <clears throat> John Snell, live in Montpelier. I wanted to update you on what's happened with the farmer's market over the past year. Good news and bad news. And it's probably the only thing that's not related to taxes tonight. So I appreciate that. Um, we had started off uh, last summer session really, really well uh, at 133 State Street. And then of course the flood hit. We were, at, we were at 133 for 10 days, 10 Saturdays and uh, boom, it was over. I made one call to Vermont College and uh, Katie Gustafson said, of course you can come up here. And I was just really moved to tears, actually. We spent the next, we thought it was just gonna be a couple of weeks, spent the next 16 weeks up at the college uh, very successfully. They were so welcoming and helpful in all regards. We couldn't count people coming in when we were up at the college, but while we were at 133, we had, in those 10 weeks, we had almost 20,000 visitors come to, through. Uh, the highest day was 2,700. Uh, I mean, it's just record breaking for us. We are in great shape in terms of the number of vendors that we have. There's a line of people who wanna get into the market and you know we'll, we'll get them in as soon as we can. Uh, but right now we're at 88 approved vendors. Uh, and on average, we have 50 vendors at every week. The big news, as far as I'm concerned, is that we brought in over a million dollars worth of income to those farmers and vendors uh, over the course of the <clears throat> summer session. Right here in the high school, and the high school is fabulous with letting us in again for the Thanksgiving market, uh, 67000 $797. Uh, so that was a, a record-breaking market for us as well. 
And I think anyone who attended will know that there was a lot of great produce there. Uh, I wanted to point out that when we were at 133, we conducted some polls and <clears throat> most of the people who come there also shop elsewhere when they're downtown. So I think that's pre pretty impressive. Um, in fact, uh, when we had our annual meeting uh, a month or so ago, the vendors voted almost unanimously to return to 133 next spring. So we will be back there. I'm thrilled. I loved the, the, the green and there was a lot of advantages to being up there, especially for families with kids, for old people who hobbled around on the grass, not so much. Uh, and for the farmers, it's a lot harder to load out and load in up there at the college than it is at 133. So we'll be back if, if all goes well. And BGS has been very cooperative with us, thanks to, uh, uh, anyway, they've been very cooperative with us. And if we can get back in there, uh, we will be there uh, in, in early May. So any questions? Yeah, I I know that there's a there's a system or a structure in place for uh, people to be able to uh, to use uh, food stamps or or three squares. Um, is is there any way to break down uh, how how much comes from those people or how 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 many people are benefiting from that? I can get that information for you. Yeah, we were, it made a big difference this year, especially with NOFA's program of uh, adding in additional uh, revenue through their coupon program. Unfortunately, that all ran out of money uh, right at the start of the winter market. Uh, but we noticed a big bump from those NOFA coupons in particular. That's but great. I can get that information to you. Thanks. Yeah, made a difference. Anything else? Well, thank you. We will be at Bar Hill. I guess I skipped over that. Uh, every uh, the second and fourth Saturdays of the month uh, with the winter market, we have, again, almost 50 vendors inside and outside there. And we'd love to see you at any, any week. Thank you. Great. Thanks, John. Anyone else? Mr. Whitaker. I will not argue for equal time because I didn't come from that prepared. Uh, but I do want to make note of it. Uh, so I've talked to a lot of folks who are Steve Whitaker, Montpelier, who are distressed at our parking enforcement is getting way ahead of our plow. It's like we move cars back and forth and back and forth, but the city doesn't plow. The, the snow from the prior storm wasn't cleaned up before last Monday's storm. And it's blocking access to businesses that rely on people to be able to walk in from the street. So you can't get to your meters to park. You can't traverse. And we can say we're short staffed and we can say, you know, but are we going to, how long are we going to milk that flood before we start doing due diligence on keeping up with our maintenance? Um, the transit center had been uh, unofficially kicking people out after 20 minutes. Um, they have officially in writing rescinded that policy and denied that it existed, uh, yet staff had admitted it existed. Um, and they're not going to be kicking people out in 20 minutes. Uh, I heard from Clayton that they're trying to staff up and be able to keep the bathrooms open all to the contract. But I want to ask the council why no one has insisted that the city enforce the lease terms and get those bathrooms open sooner than next March. You know, it's not okay to just sign a lease and give them a lease for a dollar and then leave those bathrooms closed for two and a half hours every day because we're too lazy to enforce the lease or we don't care for the unbathroomed people. It's it's not it's not right, and these are basic human needs, dignity, and public safety that we're dealing with. So, snow, restrooms, uh, 
how come you've taken no action on there being no shower at the shelter? It's it's absurd. It, and it's going to have to get addressed at the state level, you know, even if it rescinds a grant. But you, somebody needs to put a shower in a shelter. You can't run a shelter without a shower, you know. And just think about that from your your own conscience, you know. It's just so. Is it the city's responsibility to get the doors working and to enforce the height, the snow removal around the transit center? You know, it, the doors, automatic doors have been hanging, the wires have been hanging there at the handicap ramp off of Taylor for what, three, four years now? The wires are still hanging out and the paddles aren't there to open those doors. The motors are there, the openers are there. The city owns the building. Whose job is it to get those working? And whose job is it to get the snow off the handicap ramp? The city, Green Mountain is not maintaining the stairways or the getting the snow off the stairways or the parking lot. So these are these are real issues. Uh, I know our manager doesn't think so, but I'm hoping y'all will. Well, I'm, I, I this is the first I heard about the uh, door openers, and I know that the manager will be taking that up with the. Uh, with staff. Well, Thank you. please ask that he take up all of those things. Thank you. Thanks. Anybody else in the room who would like to be heard? And anyone online? I'm not seeing anybody. So we can move to the next item on the agenda, which is the consent agenda, which has removed item E and added item 15. Oh, oh, sorry, yep, item F. Um, e is in. Is there a motion? Okay, any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Want to take up Home Farm Way right now? Just, um, it's just a topic that's come up and off and on, and I'm just curious about some of the detail. Um, I know resolving the ownership has been a key concern there, and asked Bill just before when I brought it up about would there be a potential development site for some other use if the building were taken down and it sounds like with flood issues you know, but anyway that was what I was asking to clarify right so um tried to put as many of the details as possible in, in the memo knowing that some people know more about this uh so uh preservation for uh you know historic trust preservation trust of Vermont uh that VHCB is working with uh, state and others to resolve the land ownership issues and uh, take down the house and pay off the mortgage and convert that land into active floodplain. Uh, so they would expand. It, it is already, some of it is floodway, some of it's floodplain. They would expand the floodplain. So it would actually be a project to redesign that area to take on more water, which benefits downtown and further downstream. Uh, and so because of that, we really couldn't put another building in it, plus the the, uh, the, the conservation easements that are on the site would preclude that. Um, there could be a parking area. There could, be, you know, it has to remain in public use. So we're looking at what those possibilities it could be. It could be a community farm. It could be the feast farm, you know, like it was. It could be, uh, you know, potentially a dog park, depending on if, if we had, um, we have to look at the structures. I don't know if fencing would be a problem with floodplain or not. So, you know, there are some public benefits it could have. Um, our role in this, you know, we don't own this property. We've never owned this property, and the conflict around it is not uh, anything of the city's making. So we've attempted to be somewhat hands-off, with the exception of enforcing the public nuisance at the house itself. Um, but we have said consistently over the years that we would accept the property once it was all free and clear as you know sort of open space public use and so what what's on the agenda tonight is you know there's a 
a memorandum of good faith understanding amongst all the parties with a path to move forward. And it's simply saying everyone's agreeing that they will work toward getting this done and, and sort of do their part. And our part is, is accepting the property. That's really about it. Um, and we actually met last week and, you know, they wanted the, the, the MOU signed then. I said, eh, this is probably something city council should see before, <laughs> before I put my name on it. So there it is. But then I also realized we have some new folks who might not know all the history. So hence the very long write-up, but um, that's, I don't know, answer any more questions, but that's the, the short, wasn't that short actually, but that's the answer to the question. Given that it's been in the, in this council on and off for years, pretty, pretty good. Any other questions or comments? All right, is there a mo Donna? you regarding the future of five home farm way property. Moved and seconded, any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Um, next up, we have a whole bunch of appointments. And uh, I suggest that we see if there are any applicants for any of these positions and, and take them all up at once. And then I would entertain a motion to go into executive session. So for the design review committee, we have uh, applicants, William Russell and Rebecca Owens. Mr. Oh, okay, Mr. Russell, want, want to step up and just say hello? Yeah, sure. sure. Thanks um, for the opportunity to speak. I'm actually excited to apply to do this again. I, when I lived here in the early 2000s, was on the, the committee and, and was really very, uh, very happy to have a small way to give back to the to the city in an, in an area that I worked and moved away in 2004 to go into grad school for architecture and have finally made it back here with my kids. You know, love the city, just want to do my little part in an area of my expertise to, you know, just to help out and preserve the Montpelier, the spirit of Montpelier that we that we know. Any other questions? Okay, thanks a lot. And thanks for coming out. Um, and Rebecca Owens, I don't think I see either here or in the in the Zoom. Um, for the Complete Streets Committee, we have Indy Roberts, Matthew Thayer, Nancy Schultz, and John Kim. Anybody here or online? For the Montpelier Energy Committee, we have uh, Dan Jones. I'm not seeing Dan. And Homelessness Task Force, Sophie Lewis. Okay, Sophie, if you could meet, unmute yourself. Thank okay. you, it took me a second to, to figure that out. Um, hi everyone, I'm Sophie Lewis. Um, most of my career has been working with people who use drugs and people who are coming out of uh, carceral settings. So there's a lot of intersection with people who are experiencing homelessness. So I'm really excited to be part of that in, in, in Montpelier. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for volunteering to do this. Um, the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee, we have Jim Higgins and Joshua Hayford. And not seeing either of you on, on the line of uh, Historic Preservation Commission. We have Eric Gil Gilbertson and uh, Bob McCullough. Not seeing either of them here either. Okay, we have at least one uh, committee in which there's more candidates than, uh, than opening, so I suggest a motion to uh, go into executive session would be appropriate. 
And <clears throat> you want the whole quote? Sure, I'll let you do the whole thing, Donna. I move that we enter executive session to discuss the appointments on these committees pursuant to 1 BSA 313A. All right. So it's moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Any opposed? Okay. Motion to come out of executive session. And is it there a second? Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Anyone opposed? Okay. Now, is there a motion? Uh, yes. And move. Uh, that we appoint to the Design Review Committee, William Russell for the regular seat, Rebecca Owens for the alternate, that we table the Complete Streets Committee decision until the next meeting to clarify the applicant status, because there was a question about it, that we appoint Dan Jones to the three-year term of the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee, that we appoint Sophie Lewis to the Homelessness Task Force, that we appoint Jim Higgins and Joshua Hayford to the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Council, that we appoint Eric Gilbertson and Robert McCullough to the Historic Preservation. Is there a second? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Any opposed? Okay, I'll point out for and you might wonder that Robert McCullough is no relation to me, uh, although I can affirm that we had, over many years, we had uh, communi uh, mail our kids. We got stuff about their kids from schools. They got, I'm sure they got stuff about our kids, but no relation. All right. Thank you to everybody who has... Uh, volunteered to take on these jobs. The city really couldn't go without uh, without all the great volunteer work that, uh, that people devote to our community. All right, next up, we have our meeting with our legislators. We should time them. <laughs> <laughs> they would welcome us. <laughs> I just have to say until 11, like the old days. Okay. <laughs> It's an open meeting, Connor. You can stay as late as you want. <laughs> He's watching the basketball game. Where the real edge? Okay, welcome. We have Senators Cummings, former Mayor Cummings, uh, and Perchlick, and Representative Casey. Um, and we like to do this every year to uh, touch base with our uh, uh, legislative delegation to talk about what our priorities are and get their insights on uh, on what to expect in the coming session. Um, we've got some stuff that's very important to, uh, to the city government and city council. Um, you want it? Sure. I would. I just uh, first of all, we did get notice in advance from Senator Watson that she would be unable to attend and uh, Mayor and I do have a follow-up meeting scheduled with her next week, I think. Yeah, so follow up on it just so people know. Um, Representative McMahon is safe, but Senator Best. Okay, so, thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, I was actually at a session with her in the fall and she got an earful from me, so uh, <laughs> not, not about her personally, but just our issues. Um, so we did send out our legislative agenda. Hopefully you all have that. It's, you know, it's tweaked every year. Uh, and I think all of it is important and we can go through it. I think the biggest thing for the city, obviously, is flood relief and recovery, and particularly funding. I know you've heard this from the city of Barrie as well. Uh, housing initiatives, how we can support housing initiatives and moving them even more quickly. You know, we've, we've stepped into it, uh, purchasing a property and we're working with the state and they're interested, but you know you got to go through this process and that process, and you know it seems if there's something ready to go, particularly a municipality that owns property that can move things, that, that there should be a way to gear that up. And then you know two points we heard earlier: support the unhoused. 
Uh, everyone's cobbling it together in the city and, and all these other things. And it does feel like the state, um, you know, has probably had good intentions, but doesn't seem to really be hitting it right on the head, leaving it to, to others. So those were, our, I think, what the council identifies the top three areas of legislative policy. And then um, obviously some specific things in each one. Uh, some, as I said, were things you've seen before and others were you. So I would leave that to other council members to amplify and you know, said on their behalf. Sure. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I think yeah, Bill gave a good summary, just underscoring, I mean, I don't know if you're gonna stick around for the fun of the budget overview. It's really, really challenging budget. The revenue loss plus increased costs coming out of the pandemic that already we were you know we were playing catch up on infrastructure needs and all of that so just um you know i to whatever extent we can be looking for ways to you know address the things here if there's you know program funding that can help support us i mean you'll see in here there's a number of things that we've funded in recent years um like micro transit or peer outreach workers and social workers and things that are critical needs that have gotten pushed onto communities like ours and that you know we're going to have to have hard conversations about what we can fund this year and so just just underscoring and I know you know this but you know to whatever extent the state can be helping you know the hard hit communities like us and so we don't have to backslide and you know provide worse and fewer services to people who need it more than ever right now so that's just my my pleading <laughs> to you all and I know you're hearing it all over Thanks. Donna. Directly named in the agenda, indirectly about the floods, is that dam removal has been identified by the state in many reports how important it is to reduce flooding, and yet there's been no money put forth to do this. And we all know it's not just a dam, but it's all the pollutant behind the dam. And so I really want to put that on your radar heavy dam removal would really, really help Montpelier, but many, many other cities that are close. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for coming and for reading this. And um, I'm sure you'll get everything on this list taken care of <laughs> before town meeting day. Uh, so I'm not too worried about it, but but I but I just want to emphasize um, uh, going through the, the reappraisal that we had this year and then going through the appeals process, we're still, we've been doing that all fall. And now we have the abatements coming up because of the flood. And so we have, um, we're going to see a pretty significant impact to, to the budget because of that loss of property taxes that we were counting on that were built into the grand list. Um, and, but then the abatements that are coming up. And so we have um, very strict requirements for when property taxes can be abated. And a lot of people are going to meet them this time around. And we have to say yes. Uh, and it's not just the city property taxes that are abated, it's also the state education tax. And so that's the part where I really hope that you all will think about this is a state expense that Montpelier is having to absorb. And we we actually don't have the ability to absorb that um, adequately. And we're not the only community in the situation I know, but that's, so that's my particular. Oh, that, you need some I have a bill in in the Senate, which would do the same abatement. You wouldn't have to pay that we did after Irene. Um, my counterpart in the House, uh, Representative Kornheiser, has the same bill in. It's I don't know anyone that objects to it. So our plan is to get that out um, in the first week, or, I mean, as quickly as we can get it through. Um, it's on my agenda for the first week. Um, and we'll see if we we can get that at that much out. That's great. That's a tremendous. That'll be a tremendous relief for for us. And if we can get that before we finalize our budget, of course, that'll be uh, a, a big help for us. Tim. Oh, and Gary's thoughts on the. Board of Civil Authority and our activities, which I'm sure you remember, Ann, from when you were on the city council. It was a big surprise to me to find out that when you're on the council, you're an automatic member of the Board of Civil Authority. <laughs> so here we go. So one thing we learned this last week, actually, or so in, in our meetings um, that we had a good discussion the other night on is when um, 
properties are assessed for these for affordable housing entities um, that there's a different formula that's specified in the state act. Is it 75 or 78? Um, so those properties aren't looked at in the same manner that everything else we look at is. They're looked at in basically an accounting formula that's specified in this law. And um, the, the bottom line that we're experiencing with it is that um, it, it's resulting in exceedingly low numbers. Um, I think the state my take is probably pays more in pilot per square foot for their properties than these. That's, these are paying for these apartment buildings, um, which creating affordable housing is important and it's a key goal and, and we want to stay on that track. But I think the take of the committee after listening to this discussion and going through it last week is that it's gone to the point where it appears to be an unfunded mandate virtually. And um, it, it's worth looking at. So as you're looking at your tax formulas, uh, and thinking about it, that's a weakness we've discovered. That it's good. I've heard of that one. Um, probably went through a housing committee, but I've actually got a meeting with the tax commissioner next week, and I'll do some talking because I know we want to keep it affordable and don't want you know be taxed at full market, but you do have to provide services to those right. those residents, and that costs money. So I think that was part of Act sixty eight, actually. That when we did that reform way back in 2003 or something. Okay. And it should send you the chart because right. it, it comes down to like, just for one entity of nonprofit housing with all the properties that entity owns was $1.5 million difference between what they should have been taxed and what the government, the state law said we had to tax. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I was very surprised because, you know, I've been on the Board of Civil Authority for probably 20 plus years at this point. And, and maybe we've not, I, I don't remember this ever coming up. And so I think this uh, merits some discussion yeah. consistent with what our policies are. Yeah, I don't think the towns have ever been under the kind of pressure they're under right now. And right. Uh, yeah, we need to do it everything we can to help. And in Montpelier, of course, we want to continue to develop affordable housing. And so it seems like this could be a disincentive to developing affordable housing. So, yeah. Yeah. but you know, we need to, I, I don't understand it fully myself at this point, but okay. it's a question. So you've been hearing from us a lot. What are you guys th thinking about the session? I, I'm happy to wait. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's the first. <laughs> uh, first, I want to like uh, thank the senators. I know Senator Patrick Cummings, Watson, are taking the lead on some of the abatement issues. Uh, we've heard a lot about the 18 units in Montpelier that are, stand to be demolished if we're unable to raise them. So as we talk about creating more housing at the state, it's preposterous that we would tear down units in town, leaving some of our own people displaced when we could spend $2 million to raise them. And I think that's gotta be a central Vermont approach. Uh, I'll be honest, like I, I very much felt the lack of state presence in the two weeks following the flood there. And so all of you out there too, we were in the basements like slinging out furniture, you know, we were uh, at the tent with Montpelier Alive in the city, going door to door, talking to people. Uh, I didn't feel the state presence so much. The $20 million in the PCAP program is, was very necessary. It, it was uh, incredible to get people back on their feet. Uh, but we have $300 million of economic injury for businesses in central Vermont. So it barely covers Montpelier, right? So I think we got to go into the session collectively, all of us swinging and not waiting for the governor's budget to come out before we are very explicit on what we need. And we need more business funding. We need to make our municipalities whole after suffering that through abatements, you know, obviously like a direct like appropriation. But we also need to like be able to tell people in Montpelier that like help is on the way, right? It's um, like some of the business owners I've spoken to, why would I open up again? When I, I, don't, I haven't heard anything from the state that you're doing something about flood mitigation, right? What are you doing as far as a hydraulic study of the basin? What are you doing about, like, you know, looking at buffers, looking at planes and everything? 
So we, I, I think we need a full court press here. It, it goes on and on, right? It's, um, you know, businesses who lost a lot of employees uh, with these absurd work search requirements that they had to continue searching for uh, other jobs, right? When they had an open date, like the next week. So uh, Representative McCann and I will definitely be like asking for your feedback in the next couple of weeks. We'll have an omnibus flood bill there, uh, but definitely ask all of you, you know, this is more committees than all of us can cover, right? So I think we need people in committees and we need to be very loud telling the administration that this is unacceptable and this is not a city issue. A natural disaster is regional. So we, we, we need you to be like, be involved and tell us, help is on the way. And, and I haven't heard at this point. So um, I think we need to be very aggressive this session. Yes, thank you. Um, do we think um, that there's a any, uh, possibility of getting something into the Budget Adjustment Act, or are we think an uh, entire separate uh, piece of legislation? I always hope. There's a, there's a possibility for sure, and I, and I totally agree with uh, Casey that we need to be aggressive on this, and I, something that Washington County doesn't have that some other counties have is like a real county caucus where the county meets on a regular ba basis and advocates as a county for, for things. I mean, they Outer towns really rely on Barry and Montpelier, and I think they would would be supportive. But we need to kind of have that organization and and really be aggressive of it because what's going to happen is the governor's budget for the BAA is going to be we don't have any money. In fact, we're already two and a half million in the hole. So don't come asking for it. I think that's going to be their goal. So it, the more we can get ahead of that and say, well, these are essential services that the state needs to be providing. It would be behoove us to, to do that. Um, if I could follow up on that just quickly about funding, you know, I, I agree that the 20 million that went to businesses was great. People absolutely need it. But you look at that amount of money in the context of the losses, but also in the context of the state funding. And I think about that if if a comparable amount of money was allocated to the municipalities, you know, us, Barry, Ludlow, uh, Johnson, you know, the folks that really got hit the hardest, I mean, that. That would make a huge difference for us. I mean, that really would keep us able to continue functioning. Like, like I said, if you stay in here, what we're presenting, it's gonna, it's scorched earth, and um, you know, it, it would make a giant difference. Uh, and and just in make you know, we're obviously we have businesses closed. We've got the abatements. We've got the the uh, appraisal changes. We you know our local options taxes and parking just went away for all those times and still not back. Not all the restaurants were open. The hotel's not open, you know, the rooms and meals, alcohol taxes are gone. Uh, so we hit the property taxes. So all those kinds of revenue sources through no fault of cities or anybody else, it was, it's, I mean, it was a natural disaster, but that's where you count on the, the backstop to come in. And, you know, the businesses aren't getting famous since at least the city gets that far to rebuild our things. But yeah, I think this is one of those times where, you know, I'm just like it was 10 years ago when the state has to say, we've got to do something for our residents and business. Not, I mean, obviously we're looking at Montpelier, but I look at our, our partners in Bay Area and they're hurting. And, you know, I've talked to Johnson and Ludlow and others and they're, you know, they're all, everyone's just throwing their hands up. They don't know what to do. Working together all those times is going to be important. I, I, I got to say, I think Barry and Montpelier, we're fighting for our existence this session, right? Another flood hits like this. Nobody's opening up back downtown, right? We'll still have a Montpelier, but it's going to be neighborhoods like above Terrace Street, right? that type of. So this is it. Okay, I'm going to play my usual role as anti the picnic um, because I chair a money committee, and it all comes down to money. I've been working all summer trying to find. We had a number of ten million to help raise houses. Um, I got the evil eye from the chair of appropriations. Um, we've been trying to find something that might be left over from ARPA, but our revenues are not flat, but not they aren't what they've been. The federal money is gone. Uh, we've inherited the motels from that. And so the only we're either going to have to cut a state service somewhere or we're going to have to raise some money. And nobody in here has mentioned the December 1st letter 
about the 18% projected rise in property taxes. I assume that would also cause some issues here. Um, I thought housing was going to be my first agenda, but since December 1st, um, I think the property tax issue was going to be number one. F flood recovery is the number one in the legislature, followed by housing. But those were all set before December 1st. So we're going to be working on that. Um, and we're going to try and find the money we can. I don't think we could get a tax increase through. It's just everybody's hurting to increase their taxes would hurt more. So um, there's a proposal for a surcharge, but a permanent one um, that might be possible for a short-term flood recovery. I've got a bill in to allow the treasurer to do flood relief bonds which we did after 28. I have a couple old copies of them, but those would be things that people could buy. They'd be voluntary, not a mandatory tax. Uh, that's in there. I've also got a uh, bill in to ask the Department of Public Safety to look at our preparedness, not flood mitigation, but there was no shelter in the city of Montpelier and all the roads to Barry were closed. So there was essentially no place for people to go during the flood. This is my second flood in Montpelier. Uh, the first one, we had two shelters. We had no plans for the kids. This time the kids were told to go to National Life. but So we have that now. But, um, you know, just notifications. If you live on the coast, you get a robocall if there's a storm coming and you get instructions for where you're to go and how you're to get there. And there are evacuation routes marked. We don't have any of of that. People left, but they were kind of on their own where they went. And we're lucky we didn't lose someone when you hear some of the stories of people with torrents coming out of the hills. So we've got that. We are working on flood plain and mitigation, but you don't do that overnight. And the legislature hasn't been in session. The reason we got $20 million for businesses is because we took it from broadband. That was money that was there for them to go to, I believe, a federal auction. We have to put that back in January. So that's $20 million that's got to go back there. And it's it's going to be hard. Um, the state's got over $100 million in damage. And not having those state workers isn't helping downtown merchants. Um, I'm hoping we'll get back. But right now, I think the state house is the only place that's active. And that is a, that's a big loss today that the pavilion is supposed to be opening up pretty soon. Okay, good. I don't know when, but uh, I heard that from a state employee that I work with a lot. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the loss of state employees was pre-flood. Yes, That's it an was. issue we've been talking about already. I, I appreciate what you said and understand that completely everyone's dealing with that, and I'm going to state the obvious, and, and I'm not advocating. I don't know what there is to do, but when the legislature and the governor and everyone have no appetite for a tax increase, it just means they're making the local communities across the entire state raise taxes. So there will be a tax increase. It just won't be a state tax increase. And all the services will get pushed onto locals and we'll have to raise our property tax. I mean, we're, you know, just to give you an example, we're, we're talking about a budget after we leave that raises taxes 3% to match inflation. That is basically cutting everything that's in it. And that's to, to make up for all this other stuff. So um, so if we want to do more, then we're going to have to raise taxes even more than that. And I don't think there's any great desire around this table any more than there's around your table. So, but I I've, I struggle with this year after year after year when the state's like, we're not going to raise taxes and we just let the miles do it for them. I know it's not you three in particular, but give you some words to bring back to your colleagues. Great, great comments, Bill. I think, you know, we hear that year after year, whether it's a good year or a bad year, the word is, well, this isn't the year to raise taxes. Well, I don't think we're going to meet the need by selling uh, Vermont strong license plates. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think that doesn't touch the scope of the problem. There we are. Anybody? 
go out there and kick ass when you're up there. Right? No, we can show up and testify. Okay. Yeah. I think that what started out before floods and before the December 1st letter and is on the top of the agenda this year is housing. The bottom line is you have fewer people than when I was mayor, only a couple hundred, but you could have a couple thousand more and the cost to the city to provide services to that would be minimal. It would be the same with state government, but you'd have a, a larger tax base. But until we solve the housing problem, we can't get teachers, nurses, we're spending $200 million additional on traveling nurses. And that's being reflected in all your health care bills. Six million dollars just for the vet fund. Oh, for the veteran, yeah. Just on um, six million extra dollars for traveling nurses. Wow. Yeah. So thank you for coming here uh, tonight. Uh, even if city try to increase the house number, right, and create affordable housing. It will take time, right? We are talking about maybe six, 10 years. So are there any state plans to help cities like us until we create our own support for housing? So, because if we decided tonight and start building houses, it will take time. Thank you. ARPA funds into affordable housing and we're building it as quickly as we can it costs a lot more than it did a few years ago to build it, um, but it takes time. But we we need also middle-class housing. I mean, we need housing that average working people. I remember when I first, I don't know if it was in city government or first in the legislature, but we were talking about worker housing and Jesse Ventura, who was the governor of Wisconsin, had this whole model program for worker housing that they were pushing and we're still there. Um, this has been being talked about the need for just anything, but you know, high end housing has the money, they will get housing, but anything below probably 500,000, we can't do. So I think to that point, I mean, this kind of goes to where I know many of us, we, we in Montpelier have taken a big step, but I talked to my colleagues around the state and it's like, how can locals intervene in the market to help create this? Because, you know, you, you've got all this money, but I'm not sure who's getting it or how they're getting it. And when you have a community, and I'm, I'll use us, but I'm sure I was, you know, what, who's purchased a piece of property, there should be some way where the state could say, yeah, we're going to help fund um, the infrastructure that it needs. You know, we're going to make a direct cost to this. I mean, we've tried TIF. We haven't gotten very far with that. Um, Project-based TIF, I know that died last year. And um, But any of these other programs that could work to say, yes, we want housing. We can put 400 units of housing in the next couple of years. If we had state investing, we could find the partners, the private partners to do that if they didn't have to put that up that kind of money. And, you know, that... In the scale of things, you know, but instead we're just, we have to find the partner. They've got to go through VHCB applications. They've got to go through, you know, all the different programs and wait on the wait lists and all those things. And that's great. But in the meantime, I, you know, other than Chittenden County, where's the housing being built? And so how do we direct it? How do we correct the markets in, you know, our area, Wyndham County, Rutland County, all the places that need housing and need housing that's moderate? How, how, do, how do you all jumpstart that. And, and I, so I think investing the money was, you know, former fire chief used to say half a good idea. Um, you know, you put the money, but then how do you, how do you finish it, the job and get it to people that can actually make a difference? So. And that's something I, I think we're struggling with. We've been focusing on affordable, meaning perpetually subsidized housing. Um, but how do you get housing out there in the, the costs are a lot higher than they used to be, and the interest rates are a lot higher. You know, several times I've heard it's impossible to build a house that the average person can afford in this state, which is somewhere between two and two fifty, and it costs three. So, but I think with the it costs more than three <laughs> <laughs> outside of my opinion. But um, yeah, I mean it's. Um, 
and I think the reason the mini TIFs, I think it, we're not. That's just not the best way to fund infrastructure. You know, it might be a better because it comes out of the Ed Fund, and that doesn't help. Um, How much is the Ed Fund getting from right now from Country Club Road? Probably nothing. Nothing. No, because so the city. So four hundred units, they'd be getting twenty five percent of all those right. units. But it's, not coming, it's adding to the Ed Fund. It, but okay, it's so not just Montpelier. It's the town that wants to put in a septic system. Yeah. The problem, I, I just don't accept no, the I, narrative that it's coming from the Ed Fund. I am a big supporter of TIFs. Um, I did the original statewide TIF law because I think you do get a lot more back, but you, it's a hard slosh in the legislature to get that through. And this year, with the Ed Fund projections, it's going to be harder. Well, I appreciate everything you do. I don't take any of this as being hostility. Just take this as being exactly city, this city council is really working hard and facing a hard challenge this year to meet the very basic uh, needs of our community. and. We need help from outside of our community. We need help from state government. We're the we're the uh, seat of government for the for the state. We need uh, help to do everything we need to do. So, and we also need a post office. I know that you don't you don't control that anymore. <laughs> But to keep the communication going. It's helpful when we do get, you know, communications from the city manager. Like, hey, this thing is, you know, extra important, or you know, reminding us. That's helpful to let the delegation yeah. know. And but also keep it. the pressure on the governor's yeah, office. Yeah, right. It's not just that. Um, because if we have to do what needs to be done with the funds we have available, there's going to be a lot of pain somewhere else, and. I don't think anyone wants that either. So, um, yeah, I know there's a bill in for revenue sharing. I know the league is interested in that. We just have to find a way to fund it. Um, so, so what's that? Yeah. <laughs> the advantage we have is all our colleagues are coming to town pretty soon. So we got to get loud, light a bit of a fire going into this, right? And we could do it. Well, they are saying yeah, so do let us know true, also true. when we can be in the building. I think that's cut from our budget is um, money for lobbyists. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. All, <laughs> all yes. Potentially, yes. No, I remember when the mayor and the city manager went up every Tuesday morning for breakfast at the State House at 7 30. I'm not a morning person. Yeah, we can do that. <laughs> It did. I mean, it, it was a full court press because we were getting, I think, thirty thousand dollars from the state, and it was a full court press to get more money for the city. I but will say this because we we beat up on the state a lot. And we're going to talk about the budget, so I will say this: that those breakfasts all that time ago, we now get over a million dollars a year in pilot, and we're at essentially one hundred percent municipal property tax. Now, if you accept the state's valuations, they get to set their own values. So there's that. But I mean, you know, a lot of times it's like, well, the state doesn't pay their property taxes, and now they pay, pretty much yeah. pay them fully. Um, and so it started with your breakfast. So thank you, Sandy. <laughs> yeah, there's hope. There is. Yeah. yeah. About yeah. 10. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anything else from either side of the table? And again, make your voice clear to the governor's office. Um, we need his support too. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks for everything you do for us. All right. We are, yeah, speaking of, of money, we are have uh, our friends from the Vermont DLCT federal funding briefing. Wow, that's a tough one to follow. <laughs> that's for sure, the, the, that conversation. So thank you for having us tonight. Um, I'm Katie Buckley. I'm the director of the Federal Funding Assistance Program for Vermont League of Cities and Towns. And I'm joined by Bonnie Waninger, who is our um, federal funding assistance specialist. 
and we work with towns. I'll tell you a little bit about what we do, how we've worked with um, some city staff already and how we can work with you on the horizon. Um, we uh, are funded through a grant from the state of Vermont, and we work with town, cities, and villages all over the state, not just with their ARPA funding um, that they received, but to help them access the uh, all of the federal funds that are coming through the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. Um, and so we've really tried to be out in front on learning what the programs are. Um, there are over 500 programs available through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, I think 130 through the Inflation Reduction Act, and really trying to tease out through there which ones are available to local governments and more specifically, which ones are available to uh, and most accessible to Vermont local governments. Um, and there are a lot of programs. and. Uh, most of the money that towns would access are coming through the state of Vermont. They're in addition to some of those existing programs uh, that exist, uh, but with inflation, more money means not as much work will get done. So it might be advancing the existing pipeline rather than cutting the existing pipeline. If you have 30% more funding, but it costs 30% more, you're absolutely neutral. So, um, we have, Bill sent us a copy of the strategic plan. You have great goals in there. It was really exciting to read it. Um, and we would love to be able to um, better understand what your priorities are in terms of the projects that you want to accomplish. And when you have specific projects that you want to carry out, we can match those projects up with funds. So um, we've already started. We've met with staff, I think. Back yeah in january we met with staff and matched up some of the projects in the i want to say in the capital program perhaps um and took a look at some of the others that you have on the horizon um and would love to continue to work with you especially given your budget constraints as you just talked about to try and match up additional grant funding or incentives for what you want to advance within the construct fines of your budget. Thank you. Well, I think you heard our number one priority really is flood recovery mm -hmm. and rebuilding. And so I'm sure you've heard that from other communities also. Uh, can you give us any hope there? Um, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. You may, you may already know, I know city staff does, that each time there's a federally declared disaster, which this was, the state receives 15% of the value of that disaster, in addition to all the public assistance, for hazard mitigation projects. So coming up, starting in probably March or April, I think, the state will be running grant programs. And to give you a sense of scale, um, for the money that was received for Tropical Storm Irene in 2011, the state's closing out the final grants. So you could come in for a half million or a million dollar project and be able to get that money in this scale of disaster. So for towns and cities to really think about what is it we need to do to be flood resilient, um, this is a great time to access those programs. So that's maybe not the infrastructure bill, but from a flood recovery. Those are going to be public works projects, things like that. It's not necessarily housing unless you are housing and businesses, unless you're doing something with that business like elevations or flood protection buildings. Well, and we are looking at elevations for at least some of the housing. Is that something you would be ineligible? That is eligible through that. I encourage you to talk to Waterbury and and get a sense of what it was like for them when they um, had residents interested in raising house. It's not for the faint of heart. Can you clarify what you mean by that? Not for the faint of heart. Um, FEMA looks at a lot of different things when they look at raising a home. A homeowner is usually interested in having it happen now. And with most grants, grants are great. They don't happen now. You put in your application and a year to four years later, the money comes. And oftentimes the homeowners have already done 
some improvements or they've, by that point, the flood has disappeared a little bit from their memory or the immediate impact. So it takes a while. There's a lot of documentation that both the city and the homeowner would provide. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying going with, with a realistic by talking to Waterbury about their experiences. I think they started with 12 homes and one to two made it through the process. Uh, but for those one or two, it helped tremendously. And the same is true. I think Jeffersonville had a home go through the program and that one was a historic home. And that homeowner said, this is the first time we only had inches of water. They should have had feet of water in their home. So those folks from a resident perspective, in addition to the city talking to Waterbury, maybe you want a resident to resident conversation about what it was like um, so that your residents are prepared. So that I do, we have some homeowners who actually are in the area where houses were declared that they have to either totally meet FEMA's requirements or be diminished, demolished. And one is historic, so it doesn't, it's not threatened by being demolished. So that owner is going ahead and putting improvements in, but that house needs to be raised. Is something like that possible? It is possible, yes. The the home that I'm thinking of specifically in Jeffersonville was a historic home. I understand because the historic home owner is not threatened with being demolished. Now the other homeowners are being threatened with being demolished. Do you know? I mean, that's the time, like like the timeline of what they have to do before that they are forced to demolish their home and that grant comes in. Is there so that's the FEMA money. The yep. state also through, I think it was ARPA funds, the flood resilience yeah. community, the state puts some money into a program. So what I do, what I encourage you to do is there's an address you can use. It's on the state website and you put in your project and they help, they do the work to figure out based on what you're telling them, which grant program is best for you. So some of these that wouldn't qualify for FEMA or FEMA wouldn't move fast enough they move into the state program. But they're trying to use those state dollars most effectively for people who don't fit the FEMA programs well. Okay, give me your new email. I have a <laughs> regional planning commission. Right. And can I ask another question? Yeah. Dams, the dams qualified, dam removals. You have to show, so for the FEMA, you have to show, you have to go through what's called a benefit cost analysis. For every dollar you're gonna get from FEMA, you have to show a dollar's worth of incurred damages or avoided damages. So if you can prove the dam caused some of these damages, then you might be able to count that and pass. Yeah, but do estimate that. Now, some of them are two, three, maybe even older. So that's, mm -hmm. but I will definitely be in contact with okay. you. And the nice part of those costs, but nice part of the benefit cost analysis is that you get to project what's the life of the improvement you're doing. So you can, if uh, a dam removal is different, but let's say you were constructing something. Um, if that the life of that asset is 30 years, you can project how much damage would I have over 30 years based on the reoccurrence. And that helps those cost benefits numbers go up. So both the state will help you with that and regional planning commissions are often familiar with running the cost benefit model private consultants as well. It kind of sounds like, and I've heard this from other places too, that with regard to the demolition versus elevation question, that they seem to have a real bias towards demolition, regardless of the fact that it's much more cost effective to spend less to preserve the house than to demolish the house and then spend three times as much to preserve new housing. I can't speak for FEMA. I can only speak for my experience. Um, FEMA is looking at damages averted, not long-term economic having housing for people. The formulas through the Stafford Act, things like that are based on um, trying to avert damages. So if you think of that from a house perspective, having the house gone you'll incur fewer damages than even having a house elevated 
that foundation, that raised part gets wet and you still have people unable to get to their homes. So not defending FEMA, but that's the perspective they can come in with um, based on their legislation. Anyone on this side of the table? Lauren. Uh, thanks. Um, I guess just thinking about the conversation we're going to have in a couple of minutes of, you know, contemplating major cuts across numerous, pretty much every program, like what would be really helpful? And maybe it's a kind of timely request. You know, if you met almost a year ago with our staff, like really being able to look through and be like, what what projects are we are on our to do list or what is on our on the chopping block? And where might there be grant funding available? And even if you know we're not going to get it this year, if we knew that there was the possibility, and you know, put it on hold with the let's seek that, let's explore that, um, it would just make the budgeting I feel like more strategic and thoughtful. And instead of just let's trim a little here, let's trim a little here, let's trim a little here, and cut back every service and program, and then not have the capacity to go after grants, which is my other concern, is that you know we're scaling back staffing. There's all this money out there, and we are going to not have capacity to actually access it. It's just a huge loss of opportunity. Um, there is a lot of money out there. A lot of it is not available to the scale that we want. So uh, Bonnie can talk more about um, where are those dollars being targeted across the country to disadvantaged communities. Um, and our, our scale is pretty small. So a project from Montpelier might not compete on the scale that something from Dayton, Ohio might. Um, and so we're trying to match up what is available um, and accessible to um, communities. And so do, do you have a sense based on your work of what are your, like you have a siren and a red flag going, we, we have to do this project because it's putting the community at risk. I don't know if it's uh, an infrastructure project or something like that that's on a timeline that you have to advance because it's breaking down. If you have projects, you know, that that those would be your red zone projects. If you had yellow zone projects that were, you know what, they could wait, they are pretty important. And so if you have had your projects prioritized in that way, um, to then line up funding with them, some of the funding, like the ARPA funding, has a time clock click ticking on it. Uh, it needs to all be out the door by the end of 2026 and spent. So those projects that would use ARPA money, not your local ARPA money, I don't know what you have left, um, if any, uh, but from the state, if you were to access those programs, that's gonna have a faster timeline than say regular infrastructure money that came in through uh, water and wastewater programs through the state revolving fund. That has a little bit, that will have a different timeline. So, um, knowing what the projects are will help us match up. So do you have that level of specificity? Well, yeah, yeah, the city does. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, and then there's like longer term things like our entire drinking water system has like a massive big investment we need to make in the next few years. And, you know, is there money now that for a big project like that? I mean, I've seen some like community grant programs yeah. that, that are also where you do partnerships. Ones that have the most funding yeah, so I do energy. think there are big needs like that that do seem to match with where, because I totally hear you and have gotten the same message. Yeah. <laughs> like there's a, there's a bunch of, it, there's it a bunch is. of money that is not going to come to, program. yeah, and we'll there's money that we're is. We're excited program. about all yeah. of this money and then as we drill down into the programs, realizing, wow, um, it's going to be very hard for Vermont, small Vermont counties to access these programs. Um, and like, for some of your projects, can you phase it? You know, ha having that level of conversation, you have a whole water system that needs to be replaced. Are you able to phase that project? And if so, how can you chunk it up so that you can time it out with a plan um, and then match up on the goal? Yeah. You know, about what, 13 million in priority pipes and we really have to fix now out of probably what's maybe roughly a $60 million project? Mm -hmm. I think one of the questions I had, and you reminded me of it, Katie, when you just said that, it's, you know, competing on a national scale for our projects, we know are very uphill, but then there's some money that's come to the state. But my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is a lot of that the state took in and has converted into revolving loan projects. So while it might have been grant money to them, 
it's not necessarily grant money to the local government. So, you know, we might be low interest in favorable terms, but it's not the same as just getting a couple million dollars to help the, the revolving home funds got more money. Right. Yeah. So it's not all grant. Right. It's not all So I think that's the other misnomer is there was a lot of money was invested, but it's not, you, we can borrow it. Yeah. And we can borrow it at maybe more favorable terms, but it's not. So it's available to us if we, when we want to do the project, we still have to pay for it. We're going to be doing an analysis analysis of i mean i know i've talked with a number of state officials so they they are going after grants and they're viewing it at, you know as you know as like kind of doing it on behalf of communities also like the climate mitigation program for example and there's potential funding you know we're cutting an ev charger from our budget for example where that might be something that would be part of that grant for example like are you all going to be doing work to match up like, it feels like there's a disconnect. I know there's like a public comment period open right now, but I don't know that anyone in the city has been contacted to find out what our needs are directly. Um, so is that work something that BLTT is going to help with, trying to draw those connections so that money actually flows? Because they're telling us, don't worry, we're going to do it on your behalf, and then, but we're not fearing anything or getting that connection. Um, I'm going to have you answer. Okay. That's okay. So we are in contact with state folks. I'm going to use EV chargers since you brought that up. There was, as an example, there was a, there was a federal program applications closed in November where if your EGV charger was broken, let's say it was flood impacted or just broken, there was a grant program that you could go, you could compete nationally to fix that charger. Doesn't that sound great? And, um, but one Vermont community can't compete nationally. So the state, um, three agencies work together and they put in an application for EV charters. And the idea was we tried to drive communities. You had to be in a database that said, my, I have an EV charger, but it's broken. You had to be in the database. So as of a certain day, that database is frozen and the state could say, these are our folks, we're gonna fix these. So in that case, aggregating at a state level definitely works. And the municipality's responsibility was to see the emails and the notices to try and get in that database. The fact that we're in the middle of a flood and a flood response, not all communities saw it. But the state is working, how much are they reaching out? I think like the climate fund, you guys may have seen that one where they're they're asking for public comment. That is your opportunity to weigh in. They're not knocking on individual doors. They are also strapped for staffing and they are trying to have as much visibility that the programs are open. But otherwise they're assessing need based on what they know. And we're trying to listen for all of that yeah. on behalf of all the town cities and villages in the state and being the eyes and ears for all of you so that when we hear those, we make sure we put those out in our biweekly emails to really say, hey, this is, have your voice heard. And we try and amplify that and put that because towns get a lot of emails <laughs> they uh, mm -hmm. from everywhere. And so we try and make sure that ours, that we can be a trusted source for towns. Um, you, every town's our member, so we try and make sure that we have the front of towns. Um, and the state chasing those funds is the most powerful way for Vermont towns to access those funds. And so we work with, we have connections with all the agencies. And so when there are opportunities, we try and make sure that we're right there with the state agency, helping them decide, hey, if it has to get subgranted to towns, let's talk and see the best way for that to happen and how we can get towns ready for money that might be coming, uh, a federal allocation money or a competitive grant that the state's chased, how can we get towns ready to then be applicants for that funding should the state be awarded? So. Okay. Um, thank you so much for this. And I, I think I, I want to get really clear about kind of next steps. It sounds like, you know, there's, there's money, there's some technical assistance, but then there's also the connection that has to be made and somebody in the city staff has to do some work to follow up on this and talk with you. And so um, I guess that's my question for Bill about kind of what happens next and what kind of support do you need to be able to make the most of this? 
I mean, I think we we are in contact with them. I think it's it's. I, I, you you heard what Katie said. I think maybe we could spend some time, you know, in the near future prioritizing our projects. We know that you know we're really going to go for something that it's it's that one. I, you know, sometimes spending chasing money. Uh, just because it's there isn't good. You know, we know water is the biggest one, and that one has really been revolving well and not green. So, so how do we find, you know, are there grants for water? Are there grants for developing housing? You know, I don't I don't know if that's really, I mean, housing is a national, pri national priority, but I don't know if it's really in these bills. These are really infrastructure bills. Um, you know, we've looked at funding for district heat, we've looked at, you know, and again, flood recovery, if there's a way we could help partner with private homeowners or businesses or something to get some of those funds. You know, the hazard mitigation grant program is a great program. I some of you probably don't remember, but that system we use to melt ice, that way we, we uh, redirect the, the sewage outflow on into the Winooski dump, but, uh, that was paid for with one of these hazard mitigation grants. Um, and uh, so those kinds of things are good and they have long-term benefit. So to the extent that we can identify those, we knew that was coming, but it has it's I think it's in March. So we've been looking at what those are. And we have to update our plan actually, right? Mike, is that perfect? Yeah. So we can talk about that in a bit. What's that? Have staff capacity. There there could be a long list of grants that are available and what really do you have the capacity for um to to really advance because it's a lot of work to apply for, manage, and administer the grant and the project. And so just prioritizing is pretty critical. And the, the last piece I might add in is with all that money, the infrastructure bill especially, some new federal requirements came along. And to give you a sense, I'll, I'll use USDA as an example. They have grant and loan packages for communities. <clears throat> They're advising communities that would be 15% grant and 85% loan, that they might just go get a bank loan because the 15% grant, those new requirements plus cost of living might eat up that 15%. So they might not, if they go for the bank loan, they don't have all the federal requirements and they don't prop up their cost. What I usually tell people with grants is if you need them, they're good. If you do your cost benefit analysis of should I use a grant or should I use my own money or a bank loan? Sometimes the answer is my own money or a bank loan is the best answer. You're in a place you don't necessarily have that much right now to do, but um, my experience with city staff has been that they're really good at knowing what the grants are and doing what I'll call vertical stacking. Here's a project. How many funding sources can we do to make this work? But also horizontal stacking and thinking of a timeline. We've got these projects this year, these projects the next year. So if I use this grant here, I probably can't use it next year. I have to wait a few years to go back to the trough because somebody else needs a term at. And they're very good at both the, the vertical and the horizontal stacking. I, I think our staff is great at that. And these programs are new. So like who's training them on what is out there now? Or like, I just hope they're getting support because we have so, so little capacity. And I mean, it sounds like you all have such great expertise. So I'm just like hoping it's getting <laughs> They've not done the taxed and <laughs> brought in, you know, and like not to chase grants, just to look at here's our project pipeline. What is eligible? What might be the things that make sense? What doesn't make sense to chase down? Because we've seen this experience where bank loans end up being better or whatever. So don't waste your time. I mean, that kind of advice seems super helpful. So thank you for whatever you can do to, <laughs> to help guide our team. <laughs> I think we will. I think I <laughs> need to, have to help you get to where you need to be. So know we're a resource and, you know, you know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Had this former hat, the regional planning commission, is that a venue to also get a larger project to have that mass through pulling together the towns through the regional planning commission? There is, and some of the commissions are doing that. Um, I heard of an effort in central Vermont. I haven't checked in on it lately, 
but where they were talking with some of the towns about a watershed wide model mm -hmm. so that this was again something they did up in Lamoille County you can basically come in and say if I do this what might happen will that reduce my flood and uh, using I'm going to use say Jeffersonville again Jeffersonville and Cambridge they were able to use that model to put together <laughs> a package of projects that brought their flood levels down a foot. That's pretty significant. Usually a project is an inch here, an inch there, and you really have to work over time. But they implemented a series of three or four projects that did a foot. They had a pretty unique situation, two rivers, state highway, you name it. Um, but I've heard of that already in the works in central Vermont. I don't know how far along they are. Yeah, kind of I think people are going to be thinking differently as they move through this recovery than they ever have before. Towns are going to be thinking across their boundaries and looking at their neighbors and thinking in a more regional way because they have to. And so, or and resources are so slim that you know, what is that? Necessity is the mother of all invention. So I think we're we're entering that period where we are stretched. And so we need some real solutions that don't look like how we would have done it before. And I think everybody has that at top of mind from top to bottom. So I think we'll see some different things, hopefully, coming out in the, the you know weeks and months and years ahead. But know that staff, we're here for staff. We're sort of, and I would credit Bonnie, she's really the one pouring through all of those programs, reading all those NOFOs. If you have ever read a notice of funding opportunity, if you have trouble sleeping, just pick up a NOFO and read it and you will not have a problem after that. And so, um, and, and really there's a lot in there that tells you this is this could be a real opportunity or, or this might not be an opportunity. And the state is doing a great job at, at taking a look at what programs could be brought back to Vermont. Um, and, you know, they have capacity issues as well, everywhere it does, in terms of chasing those funds, but... Um... I, I will say one of the unique things is some of the new programs, or even some of the existing programs where you compete nationally, are, la are allowing aggregating the projects. Mm -hmm. So it might be something like you need a $35 million project for small communities. Uh, but you're able to cobble together. And at one point, the Agency of Transportation was talking to the Regional Planning Commissions and saying, can we pull so many culverts together to do culvert upgrades across the state? The challenge there is every culvert in that package is dependent upon every culvert in that package. And so if one falls through, uh, you can do it's some challenges. Of so the culvert, I don't think the culvert idea worked. But some communities have big transportation projects for water or wastewater, where if you can afford to cobble projects together, there might be some new opportunities there. Well, the meaning of watershed certainly is, you know, Washington County is cert certainly, that could be very helpful for us. The Winooski watershed. All right. Well, thank you very much. Just, so, yes, thank you. I wanted to reassure uh, Councilmember Hurl and the rest of the Council. Uh, Planning Department, Mike and Josh in particular, are always scouring these funds. DPW is always scouring for the funds that are related to them. Chris, looking for energy funds. So we we do have, I mean, we're not over capacity by any means, but we certainly have people that are, are looking at it. It's not, you know, and we could in conjunction with folks at the state and the PLCP. So we do have, and you know, as you notice, one of the things we didn't propose to cut was that capacity for grants and management and creating housing. You know, that was All right. Thanks a lot, Thank for being here. See you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we are. Next item on the agenda is item 16 to adopt the strategic plan, which we've been talking about for weeks at least. Yep. And, uh, and so to 
the background is that we've had a couple of meetings. We had the uh, one sort of council retreat to talk about what our most important uh, items are. And then we had another uh, more recent council meeting to talk about uh, taking the uh, highest priority items and structure them into uh, a set of goals and uh, strategies to uh, to move forward on it. And what we have in, in our packet tonight is staff's effort to condense that into a workable plan. You want to take it from there, Bill? You said it just fine. Um, again, what we we took the five areas that we finally settled on and tried to put either strategies that we had suggested or that we're all, we were all committee community was already doing um, or that you had mentioned as key strategies. And then the idea being that the sort of work initiatives would were probably more detailed than you needed to get into, at least for this. As you recall, at the last time we talked, one of the goals, one of the things we said we would try to do is put one of these goals on agendas to dig into them more deeply and make sure that we're following you know, where we're at. We'll also go through the budget with related to goals. And of course we don't, well, again, depending on how the, this process comes out, there may not be a huge amount of resources to move a lot of these forward anyway, but um, so it doesn't mean we can't try to deal with them with the staff that we have and, and those kind of things. So, but again, there you are. We, we did use this outline to, to draft the budget, but obviously knowing that it was a draft and not a final final plan. So however you want to handle it, it's really up to you. So we're, yeah. Can you, uh, I want to remind everyone to keep their voices up. Yeah, so, so. It's kind of a tricky room. <laughs> I suddenly forgot I'm in a meeting. I was just like talking to you. So when we say short term, how many months are we referring to? And when we say long term. Kelly, take that one because she's so that it will be to put those terms in clear, there. Yeah, for me. Yes, sure. Um, Kelly Murphy, assistant city manager. So we put the terms in there so that then you would pass for a read. The short term is really this year. And so as you look through the initiatives, you can kind of see what we would be anticipating doing this year. There's also medium term. So that would be, you know, two to three years. And then the longer term would be five plus years. And the reason why those longer term initiatives are still in there is because we have to get them started to continue to be in progress. Um, but what's neat about that is that then you're able to kind of see, you know, the things that we're going to be really focused on. And, you know, I think, and looking at this plan um, more intensively in terms of the initiatives, um, you can see that it's really focused on flood recovery, um, helping our downtown um, on infrastructure, and so some of the key components, um, as well as some of the um, you know uh, social services like you know our clinician and um, peer support. So I just want to um, summarize: short term, one year. Yes mid-term three to five years mm -hmm. and long-term five plus. Yes, and okay. on page four of the document underneath the um, summary of the prioritized strategies, there's a, a sort of listing of what they are, just to make sure that then it's in there. This is a really good question I thought you might ask. Thank you. And I will try to find it. So, um, are we being asked to approve every single thing on here? Or are we just talking about the goals and the strategies? Okay, so um, so the initiatives are things that might happen? Or <laughs> how does that work? It, well, it, it is a good question. I want to sound like we don't know what we're doing. Um, the initiatives are essentially a work plan to move this forward. And I think given the timing of where we're at and our ability to address this, what our thinking is, is that we, when when we then come back and have a meeting, say on the infrastructure one, then we would go through all of that in detail and make sure, you know, obviously if there's something you see in there that's a huge concern and you think city shouldn't be doing, you know, you should tell us that 
now. Um, but the idea, but these are these are generally some of these things have already been going on. Some of these things are moving things forward. So this is a general. This was developed with the staff, with Kelly, um, based on you know they've all listened to your conversations to try to reflect not only what they think what you want, but also what they know needs to happen and what we've been working on. So, um, but there's no magic to it. But so the idea is that you would, we really need the council to say, these are our big priorities. These are the strategies we want to follow. And, you know, I don't think we have the time to devote to get into that while we're doing, you know, budget. But then as we come out and say, all right, we're going to have a infrastructure agenda item at a future meeting. And then we look at all those initiatives or, you know, the next one, housing or whatever they might be, and go through and say, is, are these the things that we really want to see that we're doing? Because uh, unless you want to go through all that now, which we could, that's also okay. Or, okay. So the, I'll jump in for the benefit of the public who does, may not have this whole thing in front of them. The uh, We've got a set of goals and a set of strategies uh, on pages of four, four and five of 13. And the goals are to build and maintain sustainable in infrastructure, create more housing, rebuild and plan for future resilience in the face of climate change, practice a good environmental stewardship, advance the economy to improve community prosperity for residents and local businesses so that people's basic needs are met and improve public health and safety for all, including the unhoused. So those are the big picture goals that we arrived at over a couple of meetings. Uh, I have saw a couple of hands over here, Donna, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Lauren. Um, just you know, having having been around for a, a number of years, like the way I've seen this used, which might kind of give comfort to this, is that these more the you know what Jack just rattled off the goals and like high level priorities can help guide us. I don't feel like it's ever felt like we've gotten locked into a specific work plan. It's more, this is like our best guess right now. It always evolves based on, you know, issues that come up, things fall off, things get added on, but we want to keep a focus on these big things. And are we kind of keeping on track to that? So I feel like that's how I've seen the city staff use it as opposed to feeling like we're locking in and approving a work plan right now. It, it's never been used that way in my experience. So I, I went overly worry about every word being right, but I accept the goals and kind of high level priorities. If those don't feel right, then we should address that. Cause I do think the city staff spends a lot of time making sure that we're focusing on those things. So we want to get those right. I don't know if that helps. Uh, Karen. That, that's actually kind of what I'm concerned about is that there may be something small in here. I kind of went through this, all the initiatives and marked the ones that looked like they might cost money. Um, I mean, I'm sure they all they all come in some way, but but that you know, there's a study that's going to be done or something, and that that then you know, six months from now, we see something on the consent agenda that says this study, and it's because we and we don't discuss it because we already approved it in our strategic plan, and so if we're not committing to any of these initiatives now, that's great, um, but because I don't think we. Well, I agree with that. Yeah. That's how I view this also. Uh, yeah. yeah. I appreciate the step from our previous conversations. I think the goals are, are accurate, the major goals. We really haven't discussed many of these prioritized strategies as a group at all. Um, and I would like it to be a more specific work plan. To as the, I think the council owes that to the city as part of our job to help guide this enterprise. Um, it, it doesn't feel like it's had that kind of guidance for a while and and, and this format I'm just not comfortable with it. I know it's one you've used for a while, um, but it's just, there's just too many pieces. There's no focus. Um, I, I'm really uncomfortable with all these prioritized strategies, especially in the, we sort of talk about them or put them in our own order to help guide you. The fact is it's the wrong time of year to do this. Um, we're started too late. It really needs to start right after elections in March when you have new city council members and build it for the year. And so I think that should be a goal for next year. My proposal, if we accept this today, is to accept the, the five goals. Um, I'm really uncomfortable with all the prioritized strategies, and I would stop at page 
if you keep the prioritized strategies, which I don't favor, stop at page 11, because um, the items that go on after that that are kind of be also maybe kind of things we'd like to throw in the list, that's not prioritization or goal setting. That is just, shouldn't be there. I mean, they're good goals for the future, things to talk about, keep on somebody's radar screen. They should not be part of this document. Well, I thought you were going to say stop at page five. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be very happy with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And uh, yeah, I, well, someone else can talk. You know, and I don't want to, Donna. I, I would say that one thing that's improved with this format is that in getting the staff report on a, a regularly, besides all the quarterly, it's really helpful to see what they decide is, if they're moving along on this project through these initiatives and this one got stuck. I think that, that to me keeps me abreast of what's happening in the department. So I do like the format for that reason and the software that they've adapted to it. So I hate to lose that, but we can make it more better. Okay, so Tim, I think I heard you say you move the, uh, to approve this up to page five. Is that accurate? Yes. Is there a second? Okay. Um, do we have, want to have any more discussion at this point? Keeping in mind that we will, we are planning on having a targeted session at future council meetings of every one of these uh, top level uh, goals. I just ask a question as part of what, well, I don't want to interrupt this vote, but Tim raised a good point. And um, we always did this at, in March or April right after an election. And it was just a couple of years ago, we changed it. And part of the, the, the concern at that point was we had just adopted a budget from the, you know, the former council. So the new council would come in and sometimes it was a lot of people, some of more than a lot, but they, you know, they'd set their goals, but then it was almost, you know, not until this time of year before they could start putting funds in budget and doing something about it. So it felt like there was a big disconnect. So a couple of years ago, we said, how about if we do these goals in September, October, right before the budget, we're being clear about our priorities and we can, then we can implement them in the budget. And, you know, it, the, the, what we've run into this year is just, we, we did start late because, you know, August, September was not, not an optimal time for us this year. So then now we're bumping into the budget. So I think, you, you know, there's never a perfect time to do these. It's never, you know, they all have pros and cons. But if if the idea is to change back to doing it in the spring, it would be nice to know that now because I think we would continue to put these on agendas, but also would really be the idea that we're going to do the real deep dive. Then, if it's going to be next fall, then I think we need to do deep dives on a regular basis. So it just it's it's you know it's your plan. We obviously we rely on it heavily, and we do you know like to make sure that we're following, you know, our work is doing what you want us to do. So uh, in addition to providing basic services, so. Um, I see some of the strategies have short slash medium uh, term. So I would suggest to change that medium term instead of having two different terms. And if you finish earlier, great, right? But if you finish it in, which is two to three years, the document says me, uh, medium term will be good. And I would feel more comfortable approving or voting on short term, which is one year, instead of voting something five plus years, maybe I won't be here, right? So. Um, so that's my suggestion. Thank you. <laughs> just the motion before us now is just the first five pages. So I don't think oh, it even yeah. gets. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. No, I think I think that's a great point to make. And you know, I, I think that for years the way we've planned, we even thought about this has has been a combination of what do we need to do now and what do we need to do now to address some very long-term needs? You know, like over the years, we've done zoning uh, ordinance amendments, which are going to 
foster de housing development years into the future. And but we have to be thinking about what we want years into the future in order to know what we want to do to the zoning ordinance. Just as one example. Any other member, Donna? I just don't think everything can be done in one year. So I think that's further discussion for the yeah. future. Yeah, I guess. So I can say that for the first five pages, then <laughs> like, let's <laughs> switch the short term to medium term. Then I will contribute this discussion. Yeah, so okay. I think I see at least one member of the public wishing to be heard on this. Uh, I'll be brief. Um, I agree that the subsequent six through 15 need a whole lot more scrutiny and refinement action by the council with public comment. Even in one through five, I would suggest that you amend the second. The second column really should be activities. Not Those are not priority strategies. Those are just activities. And what you're seeking to do in subsequent meetings is develop initiatives and prioritize strategies. So those, those things that you look at, they're just concepts, you know, rebuild from the flood or develop a policy or partner on it. Those are not prioritized strategies. Um, so filling in the, the fine grain details such that you could, but we also can't afford to wait till next spring to start on some of this stuff. Some of this stuff is urgent and long overdue. So I would ask you quickly set this on the agenda to highlight in red what you what needs action before you've got time to flesh out or redo pages seven through 13, if you follow what I'm saying. There are some urgent matters, which I keep badgering you about, but uh, I'm happy to participate in it. How quickly can you get this done? How, for how little money? But that's short enough, thanks. Thanks. Um, any other discussion by the council? We have a motion and a second. Are you ready for the vote? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Any opposed? Okay, we've adopted this plan. Bill, I think you're gonna wait for a future meeting for yep. guidance on whether we're doing this again in March or- I just wanna make sure we flag that issue. Yes, it's an important one. And I think well taken. Okay, that concludes item 16. It is now 824, time for our uh, 10 minute intermission. Starting with the uh, administration's proposal on our budget. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Um, you all received the electronic version of the budget proposal last night, and uh, you all have budget books today, so you can go home and draw on them and make cross things out. And for some of you of a certain generation can draw circles and arrows and paragraphs on the back of each one. Um, see, some people laughed, some people did it, right? And um, so anyway, we uh, I'm just going to give you a quick high level view of the budget. Um, and then we have a lot of folks here happy to answer questions about any specific parts. Uh, we do have well, I'll, I'll talk about the future. So here we are. Uh, basically, our budget goals for this year are not that different than uh, any year. And it, number one is to implement the strategic plan. And we're so good that you just passed it. And already we've got a budget to implement it. Um, continued investment in infrastructure, deliver uh, responsible services, and stay within the range of inflation rate, range of inflation rate which as of uh, November was 3.1%. Uh, came out the day after we completed the budget. So we may have used 3.2% in other places, but same idea. So that's what that's what we set out to do. Um, I think really key factors that faced us, and there were many, uh, but the uh, increased costs and delays, uh, you know, we've been in kind of uh, trying to catch up since COVID. Uh, costs, you know, we've had inflationary costs, we've had costs of, of uh, staff, we've had, you know, delays and, you know, just like the rest of the world, nothing unusual to us, uh, 
inability to hire staff because of, you know, extended vacancies, uh, delays in production chains and delivery chains. So we have these infrastructure projects. And then, um, you know, as you know, in our current year, we had to rescind about a one and a half million dollars due to the flood and, you know, creating a, a, a cushion for the reappraisal changes and those kind of things. And then the reappraisal itself, not only the uncertainty on the grand list, but the impact on residents uh, who just got a new appraisal and in some cases, uh, you know, drastic change in their property taxes. So all of that conspired to say uh, we really need to to uh, have a hard reset uh, of our budget uh, based on, you know, particularly trying to stay within those um, financial costs. One of the things uh, that going back to number one, and we'll talk about this a little bit more is uh, every year, you know, I've sort of noted that we've really budgeted our operations costs very tightly. Um, but, you know, I think it really caught up with us this past year where we just, we just didn't have enough to, to do what we needed to do. And uh, part of the reason we overspent the budget last year is because we just didn't have enough in things like overtime and salt and sand and supplies and all those kinds of things, insurance costs. So we worked really hard and I give um, Sarah LaCroix, our finance director, you know, kudos for this to build a budget that really reflected what we've been spending for the last few years in those kinds of nuts and bolts issues and make sure we are adequately funded in legal costs and all those kinds of things and not taking a chance that says, well, we've been spending this, but if we drop it down, maybe we'll get by this year. And so our base for those kinds of things we feel very comfortable with, but that obviously then creates a pressure on everything else. But we we heard a lot of talk about going back to basics and doing these things. And we said, well, we've got to do the, the most important things right. So that's where we that's where we are. So here's the strategic plan that you just adopted. Uh, this was a draft at the time, uh, and I don't need to go through it. We just talked about it, but this was kind of, we use these as guidelines. Uh, although obviously, as you will see, we, we really weren't able to deliver on all of them because of, of our funding resources. So taking a look at them, the first one was build and maintain infrastructure. So we have $11 million in FEMA projects going. Most of that will be FEMA funded. That's good. Uh, although it's not really new and improved infrastructure, although hopefully when we're done, it will be better than it was before it started. Uh, we funded the capital plan fully at 2.4 million. That's been, that was the steady state goal set in the mid to late 2000, 2016, 17 in that area. We got up to that amount in FY 20. And then since then I've had to nick away at that. We restored some of it through ARPA. Um, so this year we we set a hard line in the sand that we would fully fund capital plan. That said, um, that's really not enough money for all of our capital. So the good news is we're funding the target. This is the number we promised last year that we would fund this year. Um, but as the three members of the the council that went through the capital projects, you know, today we we left three million dollars in cap in projects and equipment out. Uh, it includes six hundred and fifty eight thousand in paving. That is the highest amount since FY twenty. That's the good news. The bad news is we probably should have about a, another 300,000 in there to really do what needs to be done. We've got about $2 million for water line improvement. That includes the East State Project Bond, as well as other funds that are in our budgets. We do have money set aside in the water budget, which we will talk about later uh, for water line. But it, it, we've, so we've talked about 13.2 million being the, the prime um, goal for our water line improvements, we, we've got the first 2 million of it ready to go. And it's over a 10 or so year period. So we're, we're really on, on that. And our, we have plans for our major projects in place. The downside is we are reducing one position in DPW currently vacant. Um, and that will, um, you know, reduce our ability to do projects and respond. You know, we, we had a concern expressed about, snow removal and all those kind of things. Everything we do is going to be impacted when we have less people. Yep. So when you're talking about reducing positions, is is the thinking like not fill it for this fiscal year because we don't have the budget or eliminate it and then reassess staffing needs in the future? Like, how are you thinking about that? Well, I, I would say that we think we think that, you know, we had reached what was 
I mean, you could always use more, but I think we'd reached what we thought was sufficient staff, you know, the, the sort of right size staffing. Um, I don't know that we really, I, I think we'd like to put them all back at some point, uh, but looking at this and then, you know, going further ahead and looking at all the other needs, it's just tough to imagine that all happening next year. So, um, but certainly the goal wouldn't be to permanently reduce, but you know, the, these are, these get changed every year and we'll see how it goes. I, I don't know that we have a specific thought on that other than this is what we need to do now. And next year when we do budget, if we can put them back, great. If we can't, we won't. I mean, it's, it's driven by how much, how much we can spend, uh, how much the taxpayers can handle and what the balance of all the, the funds are, how we shift the priorities around. And then ultimately what you all choose to, to do with them. Uh, so I'm, I'm assuming there may be some other vacancies not being replaced in this FY25 budget. So that indicates some reduction of service as well as what impact on overtime. Those are two things I guess I'm gonna be looking for as we move forward on this discussion. Well, anytime we reduce somebody, um, it's a reduction in, in service. Uh, overtime is a topic that we'll probably spend a lot of time on uh, because in, in a couple of places, we're looking to restructure how we do overtime and that is easier said than done. Um, and so, um, you know, I think the idea would be that if the position was eliminated, that particular position wouldn't be filled with overtime all the time. But um, so that would just be a full reduction. But yeah, it's a, it's a it's a more complicated conversation probably when we get to those particular items. Whenever you want to talk about them, but does mean less service. It does mean absolutely somewhat. right. No, that's right. Um, yeah, and in this particular case, uh, um, you know, one DPW position is just one less person plowing, one less person responding to water and sewer main breaks, one less person doing cleanup afterwards. Um, and, you know, this is not a department, this is a department that's had a lot of reductions over the years to start with. We had, you may recall, we had cut them down and just a couple of years ago, we put two back because they were understaffed. And now this is one of those two coming back out. So, um, so create more housing is a goal. Um, uh, I guess the positive is we put 50,000 in from, uh, from, from the housing trust fund. That is a reduction of 110,000 from our you know, the initial FY24 budget and a reduction um, from 250,000 that was requested for the housing trust fund. Um, we did keep full planning and development staff to keep our grant and management uh, capacity as well as the ability to keep moving the housing project uh, and other projects forward, working with housing developers, recognizing. And we have zoning amendments in place uh, process which will be coming to you. Well, we're gonna talk about when they come to you later this meeting. Um, last year, we put 40000 in for Country Club Road. Uh, you may recall that, plus the Housing Trust Fund, plus our economic development money paid for all the consultant work that we had done. So we believe, given the fact that we have a master plan now and that the FEMA housing is going to be there um, for a couple of years, we can do what needs to be done with our own staff this year. Uh, and um, we are getting pretty sizable lease money from FEMA. Um, it, most of it's allocated for the, the water line that needs to go in, but there will be some excess. So if we need a little bit of professional funding, we can use that there. So that's our approach. Practice good environmental steward. We, we Stewardship, we have uh, kept the sustainability facilities coordinator. We kept 2000 from MEAC, which was reduced from their $12,000 request. Uh, the wastewater project continues to move forward as do CSO. You, you'll remember it, I'm sure. No, no, I just answered my own question okay. in my brain. <laughs> so, don't oh, that's nice. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, but this is the beginning of, of a trend you're going to see. Um, we've cut the My Ride funding. That is, you know, I believe it, that's our full local share. Um, the Conservation Commission has had $3,500 forever. That's cut to zero. Tree Board, 4000 cut to zero. And really one that hurts, uh, the, the Parks AmeriCorps at MYCC program, summer program that you call, they saved our bacon this summer uh, during the flood. And um, that is being proposed to be eliminated in its entirety unless it can be um, funded through other outside grant funds. 
Um, so advance the economy. We've funded 17,500 for the homelessness task force. That's reduced from 5,000 to 45,000, excuse me. Um, the, the community fund, we held it at 134, 150, which is the amount in the current budget and the prior budget, but they had requested more based on the amount of applications they had received. Uh, the 166, uh, 875 was 60% of their applications this year. Uh, and we've just kept them at their, um, at the, their current flat amount. Um, the Montpelier Alive, we did fully fund them. I don't, I think given the needs in the community, we felt that having vibrant downtown and working with them, uh, they're essential. But we cut the full $100,000 for economic development. We cut $10,000 for our public arts program and $10,000 for social equity and justice. Um, those are all going to zero. Um, Prove public health and safety. Uh, keeping the crisis intervention team program. Uh, the social worker position is being uh, finally got filled and we have an excellent person. And so we're retaining that funding. We are proceeding with the shelter planning at the, the rec center as you directed us. Uh, the senior center is largely operating as it was. Um, so that provides certainly a lot of uh, health and safety for seniors, but we're uh, we had one vacant position in fire that we held this year uh, to try to save money and we're not filling that. And then we have a, a fire position where we have an individual who will be leaving and we're not gonna backfill that position. We've also um, proposing to cut some pretty significant overtime in fire and the chief is working with the staff to try to figure out how they can meet that. Um, we're cutting the police canine program. Um, so. The officer will still be with us, but we will not continue to fund the sort of training, feeding, medical care, and there's some overtime that's required for a canine, and so that will save us about $20,000. We're reducing one rec staffing position, a full-time position, as well as some other operating cuts, and the rec child care program is being eliminated in its entirety. So provide responsible and engaged government that isn't really a goal that wasn't part of your top five but it has been on our list and it kind of uh addressed some of the remaining items so i kept it in uh we we consider staying at inflation um responsible or at least as per prior practice we've kept the communications coordinator position and the zen city platform which we are using to do all our surveys and getting things out this year we did start something new the times argus uh we have a page in the Times Argus once a month uh, for only $3,000, so we're retaining that. But we are going to make further administrative staff reductions of $65,000, uh, those yet to be determined, but we, we are on the hook for them. Uh, we are proposing eliminating the bridge page uh, for $14,000. It's been a long-running way to communicate with the community. Um, I know people just mentioned how much they liked seeing our strategic plan and the software in which we present it, but that is the Invisio software. We're proposing to eliminate that. Uh, the, again, we do the community survey. We did it last two years ago. So this would have been the year for it uh, to do. Ideally, you do it every other year. We, we zeroed that out. Committee stipends, we've zeroed those out. And the outside lobbyist funding, we've zeroed that out. So that is what is not in the budget. I'd say the the good news is the capital plan is fully funded and it's within inflation. The bad news is everything else. So just looking graphically, um, this is kind of where our money comes from. As you can see, about two thirds of it is property taxes, uh, revenues and fees. Uh, and as I mentioned, one of the, the key draws, we've reduced estimated revenues for local options, rooms, meals, and alcohol tax by about 142,000. You know, that's one of those things that by next July one, maybe that landscape will be drastically changed. Maybe all the stores will be open, the hotel will be reopened and that money will be exceeding revenues. But right now we can't count on that. Um, uh, pilot is solid, um, but those are some of our major ones. Uh, just taking a quick look at again, you have all this data. That's really as much for people watching. You need to see a little bit of where we spend money. Um, not surprisingly, you know, public safety and infrastructure, public works are our biggest, our, our biggest uh, sources of funds. Capital plan, public works together, 29, 30%. Police, 20%. Fire, 50%. You know, police and fire together, 36%. So those are those are our big areas. 
Uh, again, looking at just cutting those numbers a little bit differently. We are over, you know, over 50% of our money goes for personnel. Um, and that again is not surprising. We talk about this every year, but we are a, a people driven operation. We can automate to some extent, but we can't automate, you know, driving the snow plow. We can't automate answering the fire call. We can't, or the ambulance call. We can't automate the police response. Uh, we can't automate many of the things that we do. So there's, we're, we're always going to be people heavy because that's the work that we do. Uh, this is probably hard to read, but it is just the projected tax rate. Uh, again, the math is in your, your screen, but if you look all the way across to the bottom, you'll see that it is the 3.1% uh, projected tax increase, so 2.75 cents. I would note that the budget itself is only up 2.6% or something like that of the, the overall budget. Um, but because revenues are only up one point some odd percent, that's why that is. So I, you know, in terms of our overall spending, um, given everything we cut out of it, it's it's a pretty modest uh, spending proposal. Uh, just taking a look at how, if you take the average tax bill, and interestingly enough, based on the reappraisal now, an average uh, residential property is now three hundred and seventy thousand dollars in Montpelier. Um, so what their tax bill would be at this tax rate and just, again, uh, how much they sort of pay for service at once you back out specific revenues dedicated to certain services and general revenues. This is net, all net tax dollars. Um, just a little snapshot of if you're paying an average tax, municipal tax bill, this is what you're paying for and how much you're paying for what you get. Um, again, a capital plan. This is really a, just to show you how that plan is supposed to work. If you look in the back years, you can see there was kind of $166,000 a year growth um, in the plan, FY15, 16, with the idea of getting it up to that $2.4 million. Um, and then, you know, we had to do the rescission in FY20. We tried to restore it all in FY21, cut it all again uh, in FY22 because of, of uh, COVID. Um, oh, I guess I know what happened. We had we had already done the FY twenty one budget. Uh, um, in, in fact, it was the town meeting vote in FY for FY twenty one happened the week before the the shutdown. Great timing, yeah. So that's why these things are a little funky. But so last year we came in, or two years ago we did the two point one five four million. We were going to try to get it to 2.4 million last year, but we didn't. Um, we kept it the same, and we promised that we would do 2.4 million this year, and we have. Um, we're projecting here. We're just showing that we really think this needs to grow. We're just showing 4% a year, but we really need to be creating more money. For those of you that aren't familiar, this is a combination of pay-as-you-go projects, equipment funding, and our debt payments. So as if you grow the amount of money in the total fund and debt payments drop off, then you you sort of create additional funding in your annual dollars. And that is the goal. Or you can then make a policy choice to use more debt to achieve some of those goals uh, instead of paying for it as you go. But that's the, the basic principle behind the capital plan and just a snapshot of sort of the last 20 year history. Uh, why am I? And while we're talking about capital fund, obviously, anytime we decide to defer purchasing vehicles or something like that, that doesn't mean we've saved that money forever. Right. It, those vehicles are not going to operate forever. Right. They show up in, in a later year. And yeah, and that shows up either in an increased maintenance costs or they show up in a future year at a higher price. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's not unlike those of us at our homes, right? You know, we know we need to fix the roof, but we can't afford it. So we put it off and the next year it costs more, but that's when we can afford it. So, you know, we're making those kinds of decisions. So in terms of our process uh, tonight, we're giving you a presentation. Of course, we'll entertain whatever discussion and uh, you want to make. Next week, we have a regularly scheduled council meeting, but the only um, substantive item on the agenda is, uh, well, now we have appointment of the complete streets committee. But other than that, we have, uh, it's the budget. So that's really a time to dig in. We've scheduled a meeting on Wednesday, January 3rd, a special workshop. 
um, to dig in on the budget as well. Obviously, if we don't need it, we don't need it, but um, there it is. And then by the 10th, we should be holding public hearings. Doesn't mean you have to finalize your budget, but we should be at least have something that we're presenting to the public as a, at least a draft budget. We've, we popped a meeting in there on the 17th. If you want another council workshop, don't have to have it. Uh, January 24, we do have to be done. That is the final public hearing. And that's when you would improve the budget and the warning and all, you know the ballot for town meeting that's to meet the, the appropriate deadlines. And then town meeting is on March 5th. So, and, and of course you have, you, we have the ability to call even more meetings if you'd like them. Uh, I don't know, you know, how, how much you want to spend on this, but um, you, we, it's certainly the key policy document that you have during the year. So, um, you know, you need to feel comfortable with it. So that is a process that we've outlined so far that you've outlined, you adopted this schedule a while back. And that is the proposal that we've provided to try to stay within the financial constraints, fund the capital, and at least distribute the pains, such as it will, uh, across the board and in, in areas to try to at least hit some key support for some of your key goals, even though recognizing we're taking funding away from a lot of them. And I say we, we're proposing, and I guess that's it. So I don't have any more in this presentation. Like I said, most of the department heads are here. If you have specific questions about their departments, we are, I think, still planning to do the videos, um, but certainly are also able to have any of them meet or talk with you at any time in this process. So that's all I have. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Um, Lauren. Can I clarify um, or other people have more substantive so there was the issue raised about the education tax abatement piece. Is this assuming that we are, that that is going to pass and that's built in, or are you assuming we're not getting that? So this assumes, um, this assumes the same grand list as this year. So, so there is some risk in terms of if there were appeals, um, th that's different than the abatement. So the, the appeals that you've already granted will lower this number a little bit. Um, and we'll probably have to make an adjustment once we have a better idea at some point during the budget. Um, but there may also be some growth. We're not aware of a lot of it, but people could have done construction and those kind of things that were, weren't in this grand list. As far as the abatements go, we have not accounted for that. We did put, there is a, a factor in the rescission that we made this year for this current budget when we said 1.5 million, I think, we had some allowance in there for some of that if if it were to come to fruition. But frankly, you know, if if worst case scenario and they were all granted and we had to pay one point five million dollars, I think we'd be having fire sales and you know, big sales to fund the government at that point. Um so uh, but the uh, yeah. So we, we try to account for what we think is reasonable, what we think is gonna happen. Um and we don't know how many, you know, there have not been that many abatement applications as we understand, but they still could come. And we certainly know a lot of people that had properties out of commission for a while that um, weren't doing what they need to do, so. Okay. Questions, Frank Carey. Oh, so at the last town meeting, um, we, we approved uh, a potential bond right that would include confluence park and other things potentially but we haven't actually issued that bond right um so how does that factor in here in terms of potential revenue i'm gonna so normally we would i don't know i'm gonna ask sarah how she have we got approved bonds um, projected into the debt payments no so so if if we were to issue that debt then then that debt in um future years would go up and the annual amount would go down. Assuming we stayed at 2.4 million. So that just stayed flat, you know, it's a fixed sum of money. So as one goes up, so. We have done some of that work in that bond. Just, we haven't done the confluence part portion, but we have done some of the other work and some of it is in progress. Right. So some of it will have to be. But was 
was your question, are there projects that are in the budget that could potentially be use the bond for that would then free up other resources or no, there's misunderstanding. Um, yeah, that is, that is my question. So are there, is there work that's being planned in this budget that we're counting on money from that bond for? No. Okay. No, no. Cause that's all from, you know, that's prior work that we're planning on getting done that was already approved. Uh, things like I'm trying to remember what else was in there, the street light, uh, the signals, and there was a retaining wall and is that where the heat in the town? Yeah, the, the, the city garage out. energy uh, re retrofit. So that that's all work we're still working toward. Um, you no, know, any these are all new. This would be new money. So the only thing I suppose. So if we didn't issue all of the bond, we could conceivably use what's left for something else. We'd have to look at the language of the bond, or maybe revote it, or something like that. We are not proposing, just given the overall situation, um, we're not proposing any bonds this year at all, uh, because we just need to, like I said, a hard reset. Confluence is still, a, uh, it's, it's still gonna come back to us for mm -hmm. approval in the next year, in this budget year. So, Presumably, isn't it? Yeah, isn't the time. So there's there's a deadline for people to, um, for them to bring in money, and I, you know I actually it's going to be in the weekly bevo, but we just found out yesterday they just got another two hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollar grant, so they're getting closer to the total, um, and so at some point, I'm suspecting some they're going to come in with a fully funded project, and we're going to have to decide what to do with that. Right, and so if we. Um... If we go ahead with it, the the investments we've already made are taken care of by the grant money. If Correct. we don't, then we're on right. We're so on we would have to pay that, that off. And that's not in here. No, that would be assumed to be within the. So, what we what we would probably do is let that part of the bond. So mm -hmm. the bond was like one point eight million so or one point two million. Bond. So six hundred was for that's we would let one hundred and fifty thousand and not the remaining four fifty. Okay. So it would be in the debt payments in the future debt yeah. payments. Thanks. Okay. Yes. Uh, I've got a few questions. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure I'll have many more as, as we go, go on. Um, uh, reducing overtime in, uh, in fire. How do, how do we do that? I know Chief Gowans is here. I, it, I just it strikes me that mostly we have overtime because it's stuff that we have to be doing. We we have to make people work over their allocated hours. Yeah. So it, it's a pretty complicated situation, and I'll try to do it just as quickly. But I think as we go through it, we might want to talk about it more. It really has to do with scheduling. And uh, so obviously when there's a call and people come in for a call, we have, that's not what we're talking about. But there are, you know, I think it's how many people are on duty at particular times. Is there, you know, do we need to call someone in if someone's on vacation or calls in sick? Because uh, some overtime, you know, Bob's out today, so we call Mike in to fill his shift. That's overtime. So can we schedule in a way that we don't have to call that person in? Are there ways that we can you know, stack our, our, uh, our group differently. And, um, you know, where Bob's talked to the, the team, they're trying to work on it in the fire department. I mean, obviously there are pros and cons to all of it. And, you know, the downside is there would mean probably there would be less people on duty at certain times and that affects service and response and those kind of things. I mean, there's no, no question when you, you know, you make that kind of reduction, it's going to change. Is it, you know, and I think we need, we will have more information about time of day and response and those kind of things as, as we go into that, uh, where uh, that's what we're working on. But that is, that is one of the tougher um, challenges of all the proposed reductions. And, uh, you know, obviously if we can't find it there, then we've got to find it somewhere else. Okay. Um... We're talking about eliminating a position in public works. 
Um, I think we've all been getting emails from people and it comes up every year. I'm convinced that the alternate side of the street parking system was the way to go. But I've also heard you say that uh, there might come a time where staffing reductions would force us to get out of that. And so we we looked at that at one point in our deliberations, we actually looked at reducing a second public works position. And the DPW was clear. They said, if we do that, first of all, they weren't in favor of it. But if if we do that, um, we will have to go back to a full winter ban. We, we cannot do the alternate side because that means people coming out a couple times, you know, coming in during the, you know, they said, we will have to go back. It's just so much more efficient for them to have November 15th, April 15th, or whatever it is, no parking overnight on the streets any night. Mm -hmm. And they can do what they need to do when they need to do it. And, you know, we did that for years. And as I, I find out, it's really, that's what most people still do. Most communities still do. It's really just us, Winooski and Burlington uh, that are doing other things. Uh, and, and, and in fairness, it's to make it our downtown more livable. It's, you know, a lot of people are in apartments and you think about it, that disproportionately affects lower income people who don't necessarily have a driveway and that sort of thing. And so they need a place to park their car. And, you know, that's why we did the bands. We tried that, that didn't really work. So we tried the alternate side of the street. Um, but if we were to reduce our public works capacity, we, we would not be able to in any way, shape or form adequately maintain the roads um, without going back to full band. So people would not be getting their tickets, but they also wouldn't have a place to park any night all winter long. Correct. So they still they get tickets so they park on the street. Right. Right. And they but, can get towed. Right, yeah, but presumably more of those people just get the idea they just can't park. And I know that, you know, a lot of people, I'm just, you know, this isn't really the topic, but because I know people are interested in this. Um, you know, I know it's counterintuitive. It's a beautiful night. There's no snow. Why am I getting a ticket? But the fact is that we don't always know when something's going to storm or when something's going to ice and they've got to get out and do um, salting or uh, or maybe they're coming back. And we we tried. We tried for a couple of years to do a, only calling bands when we needed to. And it just failed miserably. I mean, we towed so many cars and we ticketed so many cars and it really failed on the follow-up nights. The, the nights was actually storming. People kind of got it. Oh, it's snowing tonight. I probably need to move my car. But then two nights later, when we wanted to do cleanup, we did all the announcements. We sent out all the notices. We did everything. And we'd be towing 35 cars. And, you know, the tow trucks couldn't keep up with it. So then the cars would be on the street. So we'd have to go around them, leaving mounds of snow. And then people were unhappy. I mean, it, it's a great idea that doesn't really work. Um, so... And having your tow, car towed is a little, way worse than getting a ticket. Well, you could still get a, a, a tow now if if you're if you are on the street on the wrong side of the street and they are actively plowing. Mm -hmm. But my recollection but is of the last it, couple of years we haven't had much towing. Correct, it's been way down. Um, you mentioned the uh, district heat fund. I know it took some damage during the uh, flooding. Will that be fully operational? Should be. I think it almost is now. Perhaps working. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. Great. There were there were a lot of issues. Um, some of them were issues with the city. Uh, some of it was issues in the the individual buildings with their meters and their hookups. And we've been working trying to get those corrected. So, you know, it's actually been one of those interesting things. We've been able to provide heat for a while, but some people haven't been able to take heat. And we're even trying to work through that. Like, do we bill them for heat that they couldn't take? that we could provide. And so that's, we're, we're sorting that all out too. That's another whole, we're trying to keep you all out of that one. They've had some mechanical damage yeah, to the building. Yeah, yeah. right. So, mm -hmm. you know. Um, some of the smaller things like the tree board or the conservation commission, um, obviously they're, they're not big dollar items, but uh, one, operationally, what does it mean? And if, and two, do they get also get outside grant funding that they can fall back on? You know, you should probably talk to them 
you know, we should maybe ask them or ask, is Alec here? I don't know. Or, or Arnie. Alec was here. Can you Alec's speak here. to either of those? Do you know? I know um, some of them have some money in the bank, some don't. Uh, we had difficulty sort of choosing between those types of things, saying, well, this one can stay and this one can't if we're just going through some. Hi, Alec. Sure. Um, I'm also the staff liaison for the tree board and the conservation commission. So they, um, do occasionally pull down grant applications or a uh, successful grant grants for various projects. And I would say that those dollar items go to either matching them or doing kind of specific committee projects like the VSEC rain garden, I think is a good example of a one that sort of a combined grant and city funded project that the conservation commission put on. So they tend to do those kind of small projects that, um, keep people on the committee, you know, or keep their interest going. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, yes. Uh, Donna. Uh, well, I had a, a detailed letter from one constituent. And one of her comments was, most of our staff seem to be hourly. Are we following the normal kind of hourly rate, uh, salary rate for those that are indeed more management than hourly employees? Um, yes. I mean, people that are salary don't get overtime or, and don't work on an hourly basis. She was wondering if there were more that were eligible for that, if a review of that could... We. We look at that a lot. Um, and there are some, you know, very specific standards as to, you know, how independent you work, how much you supervise, uh, what you're responsible. Can you make independent decisions? Um, I, I would say we're pretty, we're pretty. Uh, I think we're in pretty good shape on that. Actually, we have a fair amount of salaried people, but not not everybody. You know, I think, um, I, I think we've done that analysis on virtually every position. Okay, I assume so, but I hadn't. And, you know, quite frankly, particularly when people move out of one category to another, say when they get promoted, you know, we have to make sure the salary is enough yeah. to make it worth um, them not getting their overtime. So I don't know if it's a real savings per se. Um, gotcha. And, you know, it might be on the short, on, on a given week, it might be that somebody's at a council meeting and not getting overtime, like all of us that are here. But uh, on the on the whole, um... likewise, felt like there are a lot of services we provide, bar, police, uh, and senior center, where regional people come in and do not necessarily pay a more compensatory fee for that or any fee at all. And whether or not there was any movement to more to looking at that. So um, that, of course, is is. Our, our budget conflict in a nutshell here is that we provide services for 15 some odd thousand people on any given day and paid for by eight. That's, you know, we've been talking about that for as long as I've been the city manager here. Um, so some of our programs like rec and seniors have differential rates for non-residents. It's about 50% higher for non-residents than it is for residents. So activity fees and membership fees and those kinds of things. Um, fire department, ambulance calls are billed um, against people's insurance, whatever. So regardless of whether you're a resident or non-resident, you get a bill. Uh, you know, fire calls are typically in the city um, unless we go on a mutual aid call to another community and we get mutual aid responses to Montpelier. Um, you know, police, we don't bill anybody unless we find them. Um, we don't build them for direct services. Uh, so, you know, every, everything's a little bit different. The parks, of course, or, you know, people come from all over and there's, you know, those are free for everybody. Uh, the state does pay, you know, as I mentioned, full pilot. So to the extent that they are at least are paying for their impact on it, you know, their workers and the people that come to the state uh, that, you know, for whom we're, you know, when we plow State Street, are we plowing it for the resident that's commuting to work or for the non-resident that's coming in to go to, you know, we're just plowing it for everybody. So uh, it's, you know, that is, that's a, that's a nutshell. And that's why 
you know, I think that's one of the reasons why the council adopted the rooms, meals and alcohol tax so that, you know, non residents that are staying in town and eating and, you know, those kinds of things are at least contributing to the well being of the community. But there's certainly no perfect formula and we're not alone in this. And I know Burlington, Washington, DC, you know, in New York, they're always, you know, trying to figure out how to deal with that. I remember one year we talked about taking away sidewalk plowing and the city not doing it. And citizens did not want us to do that. But at this point, we've expanded sidewalks to the point that we've got four sidewalk plows. Is that correct? Uh, Kurt's not here. So um, I think that's right. It's at least three. I'm not sure it's four. And maybe there's a fourth as a backup. They <laughs> break a lot. <laughs> one they maybe. break a lot. But if I looked in here, I probably could find the exact what we pay for sidewalk plowing. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. It's not probably not broken out that way. We'd have to do some analysis. I mean, it would be, you know, we have staff that respond. And when there is a, when there is a snow event, um, some people have a plow route that they're driving on the roads and others have a plow route on sidewalks. Um, so they would be part of the general cost. What we can tell you, and we can give you this data at a future meeting, we do have now, uh, we finally implemented the new asset management system from DPW of the last couple years. And they can now tell you what, what their direct cost for a storm is. And I think the, it was just a couple, the one a couple weeks, it was like $25,000 for counting their staff time, vehicle wear and tear on the vehicle, salt, sand, everything. That they're doing but that's all of it. that's right. not breaking out how much is sidewalks and how much is roads they might be able to do that i don't know somebody just turned your camera on is that because you have something uh, some information to give us i was trying to give you cover yeah, there man i had to get cleared to be unmuted here um yeah just just letting you guys know that we have um three sidewalk uh, plows. We have actually four units that can be used, four pieces of equipment that can be used for uh, sidewalk plowing, but three operators dedicated to the sidewalk routes. Um, just for clarification, uh, we don't, and we can, like Bill said, we can break out the cost um, specific to uh, snow removal on sidewalks as opposed to streets. We haven't done that yet, but um, we're still, you know, we're in the infancy of the um, asset management software, still learning um, how to use it, but we certainly could uh, work on that. So that's something the council's interested in and seeing. Thanks, Kurt. Um, Sherry Rockcastle, uh, you had your hand up a little while ago, and uh, I wanted to make sure every, all the council members have had a chance to ask their questions, but I definitely would like to hear from you if you want to unmute yourself. Okay, looks like you're unmuted. Okay, sorry about that. What I had just, ex uh, when I didn't know I was muted on my computer here. Um, first, are the council members, I I'm happy to wait. I'll go after the council members have had their opportunity. No, you're good to go right now. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the presentation. I had a couple of questions, yes. Um, for example, sometimes when we cut resources, we could also be cutting revenue. So one item I saw coming off, this is just basically to understand it better. I'm sorry, I'm not using my camera. I'm actually sitting in a dark living room right now, <laughs> come to find, so. So maybe that is your camera. Pardon mm -hmm. me? I said, maybe that is your camera. Hey, there you go. Um, what I wanted to ask is under economic development, the $100,000 being cut, what had that been generally used for? What would have that? been used for please so that that's a great question um uh, and one we struggled with there had been a group called the um what was the name Montpelier development corporation who had formed and we provided them a hundred thousand dollars a year in funding i think they used that to hire an executive director and run their operations and they went out of business two or three years ago 
um, we retained that money to for various projects. So last year, that entire hundred thousand was dedicated toward the development of the Country Club Road project. Uh, that plus the housing trust fund plus an additional forty, basically funded all the the consultant work that developed the master plan and and all the other. Uh, ran all the public processes and that kind of thing. So we don't have a need for that for that work this year, but you are correct that in general, having funds for economic development is a good idea. May I ask though, that brings me to my next question. And this is another you know sense of ignorance that I do have, but when I think about economic development and the businesses and what I do, I'm unaware right now, and this is, I apologize, this isn't probably the place for it, but as we're talking about budget, economic development, I'm thinking about the recovery for, and the future planning for, you know, for what we're doing regarding um, weather events. So yeah, uh, where does I'm that sure. fit into the budget, may I ask? Uh, well, that, I'm sure there will be a lot of conversation about that. There is not a lot of money in there or really any specific money allocated to that other than in, in projects. We just heard a presentation about uh, hazard mitigation funds that we could be using. There is a Montpelier Commission on Resource and Recovery that the city is a co-sponsor of. And we have a, a one of the council members is a member that is absolutely, that is focused on that and going to be making some recommendations to this council and to the community about projects that should move ahead. And you're out, you know, you're right. That is a source of funding that could be used for those purposes if we had it. Um, so, good point. Okay, thank you. And I did jump in after uh, feeding my family, so I didn't ah. see the front end. The last, only last question that I have, thank you for your um, time. The other cut that I noticed is, and again, just living where we live and um i wanted to know what what have we done in the past with the ten thousand dollars that we're cutting for social equity and justice um i may let someone else answer that question lauren you want to uh, there's a committee that does that and it's basically helped fund the committee's work um in but yeah, yeah. there's there's two line items um that are uh, proposed to not be funded. So 10,004, the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee, that group, um, for example, we had hired a consultant who had worked with the city. They had done extensive outreach, stakeholder engagement, developed an equity assessment of the city, an equity plan with a suite of recommendations that we've then been working through to try to implement to make our community more equitable. Um, and, and then one of those recommendations, for example, was a stipend program. So people serving on city committees um, could access a stipend if that would help make it more accessible for more people to be able to serve. Um, yeah. Also proposed for a cut. Okay. So it's that type of work, if that helps. It does. Thank you. Thank you. And, 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 uh, and lastly, just to educate, um, educate a property owner here in the city. I, I just ask, what is a public's next step when we wanna raise our hand for reconsiderations in this process? Is there an opportunity for that? Is it on one of those next two meetings that are coming up or what would yeah, that be? Any, at any of the council meetings that happen, they're all open to the public. Council usually takes public comment. And then there are two formal public hearings that are required for the budget. And then obviously, uh, we get to vote in March, uh, but you know, in terms of how the council shapes their budget, the, the, all of those meetings that we noted um, are open and available for public participation. Yeah. Thank you. And Lauren asked earlier about the educational uh, abate. What is it called, Lauren? Abatement, education abatement. I forgot the name of it, but um, and I know that school boards, you know, really grapp grappling with that. Do we have a date in mind of when they'll have some more information? So those are actually two different things. Okay. The school board, and I don't pretend to be an expert on school funding, but the, you know, the school board has now a new funding formula that changes the way student weighted students are reimbursed. And that is the sort of rate shock that they're dealing with because Montpelier doesn't fare particularly well under that state funding. And in addition, I think the state recently announced that re education taxes statewide could go up 
as much as 18 percent. If you know, our Senator Cummings was talking about that a little early, earlier tonight, those are direct education sort of school budget related questions, not that they don't affect all of us. What we're talking about here was under the law, if a, if a property gets abated because of damage, you know, fire, flood, whatever, and the, the city chooses to abate them, we have to, you know, they don't have to pay their municipal tax or their education tax, okay. but the city has to then pay the education tax for them to the state. Um, and basically our, our pitch to our legislators was we have, we don't have the money to do that. We can't make up the difference. Uh, so we are asking the legislators to pass a bill that uh, under flood circumstances, basically the state would pick that up on their own. We, the, the local taxpayers wouldn't have to pay the edge share of an abated property. Thank you so much for that educate for all of the help in understanding better tonight. Appreciate it. That's all I have. Any members of the council? Yeah, go ahead, Donna. Two about the elimination of the communication coordinator. It's not eliminated. This, oh, okay. That's what I'm reading says elimination of communication. No. So that 90 is not there anymore. That's not, that isn't. As well as the sustainable facility. Yeah, those are both in the budget. Good. Good. Thank you. Um, is there anyone in the member of the public in the room who'd like to uh, either raise questions or address the council at this stage? I'll be real brief and pick it up again another day. It's late. Um, just on the parking issue, I think that the, especially related to the costs of plowing and this, the costs of towing and the costs of tickets, there's a complex revenue thing going on there that the people don't understand why if there's no snow and the storm two weeks ago hasn't been cleaned up, you know, as soon as the first as the storm is cleaned, as, as soon as it storms, it should be cleaned up. And then until there's another snow, parking should be relaxed. You know, we, we don't need to write a lot of tickets and tow cars if the roads are clear and there's no snow going on. So if we have to go to the, you know, flashing lights or robocalls to tell people this is a night where everybody's got to get off the roads, that's one option. But I don't think we should, what I heard, if maybe I misheard it, but what I heard Bill say is not the understanding of most people who are wrestling with this thing. It's not fair. It's not reasonable. And I'll repeat, Many of the folks who you need to be hearing from have thrown up their hands because they don't have faith that it's worth their time to come and talk to you. I still have a little bit to. <laughs> so just to quickly answer that um, for those that are listening that have faith. Um, we did the robocalls, we did the flashing lights and it did not work. Frankly, we were towing and ticketing way, way, way more cars than we are now. Um, it was abject failure. Uh, we don't tow on nights that we're not out plowing, we, but we do ticket because people need to park in the right place because we don't know when a storm can happen. You know, the the problem is, you know, there, for every person that doesn't understand why they're getting a ticket, there's someone else who thinks they're going to beat the system, and then their cars are parked in this plow way, and we can't plow, and then the it, the situation gets even worse. So we have a rule um, back when we back when we had blanket. Um, blanket ban from November to April, we still ticketed no matter what the weather. I mean, this is not a new thing. It's, it, it is a, it's there for operational purposes. So I appreciate it. It's not a revenue thing at all. Ideally we would never issue a ticket because everyone was complying. That would be best case scenario for us. If people were on the right side of the road or in their driveway or wherever, and we didn't have to issue an entire ticket or tow anyone all winter long. Bill, um, I wanted to follow up on on the question that the caller raised, which is how do we balance revenues, lost revenues with cost savings for, for all of those items on the budget that we're cutting, like the, uh, the rec child care program. I assume the savings that you're talking, you've got in here is net of 
any lost uh, fees. That's right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I we invested in, the, I mean, that's a, this is an old story, but we, you know, the city chose to invest in MDC and Tim, I think was involved with that. And, you know, I'm not sure we got direct revenue results you know, really, I, I don't know that it worked. I think everyone really tried and there was a good faith effort. Um, you know, I think if we had a specific project to invest in, um, we probably would have kept that money. You know, if there was a reason to say, hey, if we spend this kind of money, we're going to get this much money back. But um, but holding $100,000 this year, um, you know, we would just be cutting more services somewhere else. Oh, yeah. yeah, I, I think that's an easy cut to sell. <laughs> you know, we're at zero sum. Anything you put, I mean, that for us, we were at zero sum once we hit the 3.2 target. Um, and just to get to that was, you know, huge. So, um, you know, how you all choose to handle it, of course, is your decision. All right. We've got it. Many more hours to review these like budgets. Oh, back. Sherry, you're back up. Thank you. Sherry Rockes, are you? Yeah, unmuting is a process on this. It's not one click, it's a couple. Uh, only to clarify that the sometimes a question comes for understanding, not necessarily an opinion. I had no opinion, but I did want to understand. That's all. Yep. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Great. I appreciate that. So we will have many more opportunities to spend hours going over the budget book and uh, uh, for anyone who's watching out there, if you if you go to the city's webpage, everything that we're hearing is gonna be on the webpage. The city's bud budget book is already up there on the webpage. So you can see in more detail than you ever would have wanted to. Uh, what we're spending our money on and what we're pro proposing to spend the money on. And I hope everyone will um, review that at whatever level of detail you can uh, tolerate and make your, make your views known because we are spending our taxpayers' money and on what we think are important and often vital services. And we want to make sure that we're we're getting it right because taxpayers are going to be the ones making the decision ultimately. Lauren, did you have something to say? Yeah, I know. We, I know we have lots of time to to discuss. Um, I mean, first of all, just I do want to say thank you for the hard work that went into this. This was an incredibly hard thing, and I know that the ability of the team to come together to try to figure out how to make this work just really, really grateful. A lot of cuts that are giving me a lot of heartburn, as I'm sure they are at the staff, um, that I look forward to discussing further. One just random idea. Did you get, did you think at all about like a pot of money, like twenty thousand dollars for all the committees that are getting cut that would be like a smaller amount, but that I just I hate to like miss out on if there's opportunities where like you've got to put a little bit in to access some kind of grant or something that you know, ten thousand dollars, like something that could be like a just a fund that was a committee fund that everyone who's getting zeroed out. I don't know if we've ever tried anything like that. I can already see the logis logistical challenges with how you figure out who could access it, but just, you know. Cage match. Cage match, you know, but if you got a grant on the line, being able to access $500 lets you get it or something. Anyway, just an idea to ponder. <laughs> hmm. To answer that question, we did not think about that. I mean, we were, um, you know, it was all we, it was pretty challenging. And then when we got, I think to the end, I think we told you then we got our insurance information that we had to find another hundred thousand uh, dollars. And that, you know, that's when the parks thing went from above the line to below the line and, uh, or from below to above the line, that's right. Um, but yeah, so uh, yeah, it was really, I mean, there's a lot of bad ideas in, in this budget. It, it's only for one year, but, you know, it is only for one year, but then, you know, yeah. the cost of building it all back, I mean, how much is what's going to be the appetite for, you know, that next year? So it's, uh, you know, it's probably going to be, 
a four to five year period to try to build back. I mean, real realistically, you know, unless you know, unless people next year, I, I you know, haven't really seen a council sit around saying, no, how, let's just raise the budget 15% this year to do everything we want to do. And I, I get that because people can't afford it. So it's not that to be glib about it. So I think it's going to be next year, we're going to be, well, what's inflation? You know, can we do that? And how much can we do within that? Now, you know, the good news is, you know, like I said, maybe some revenues will come back. Maybe we'll have some development, maybe, you know, but those are maybes. We don't know. I just remember the pandemic actually hit three budgets and the public doesn't want to remember that. And so I think definitely the flood is going to hit more than this budget. And in, in these workshops, I guess every time we have a meeting, we're going to decide whether or not to have these extra workshops or not, like in January 3rd. So, I mean, I think, I think it's just, you know, there's no sense meeting, you know, if by chance you all decide on the budget next week <laughs> and I mean, you did last year. Yep, you yep. were done before Christmas last year. So, okay. and then well, we I went straight to public hearings. Just... I understand, but I'm just saying that, that so there's no yeah. sense holding a meeting if you don't yep. need it. So yep. I'm assuming, but they're also on the calendar if if you need them and want them. And we can always add more. It's, it's your time. I think one of the things to consider whether it's for, you know, you want to talk about tonight or, but is how you want to do that. I mean, our, you know, years past, we've had presentations from department heads. We were planning to do those by video this year. Um, but if you want time to meet with people, or at least some of them, um, that would be good to know so people can prep in advance. The other thing, um, just so you should know, is at the next meeting, um, while it is all budget, we're going to um, Evelyn's going to present the results of this budget survey that closes today. So we'll have that will be startup. So we'll hear what we've had pretty good response to that, right? I think pretty high response. So you'll at least get to see what the resident said to the questions we asked. Um, well, I guess along those lines, one of the workshops I would really like to see us do during this budget hearing meeting process is paving. I want people to have an opportunity to hear from DPW and learn about the paving inventory, how the roads are graded, why we repair this one, not that one. We get so many emails about paving. And I also <laughs> think they need we need to really help the public understand the capital improvement plan, not just the, what we're in debt for, but what's all behind that and the planning, because I don't think people realize how far out you plan your capital improvement plan. So I really like to see some workshop time set aside for those two elements to be presented. I think that's a great idea. All right. I think we can close out this item and move on to other business, which I don't think we have any unless someone wants to tell me otherwise. And then we move to city council reports. Start down at your end, Donna. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, me too. Me too. Okay. Couple random thoughts. I think just for going through this process, um, because tomorrow night we have Board of Civil Authority and soon we'll have tax abatements. I don't know, John, if maybe we can have some kind of tutorial for members of the Board of Civil Authority in advance of our first hearings. Just I don't really understand how tax abatements work. And I, I think the temptation, knowing pretty much everybody involved, is that they're I'd rather not have personal judgments, but rather know what the rules in general are for the tax abatement process. Sure. Maybe that's something we should talk about at the tomorrow night. Tomorrow yeah, night. I was thinking yeah. throwing it out for that purpose. Great idea. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's a moving target, too, so it's uh, good to talk about it now. The only other thing, and it doesn't really affect this budget because we're not going for more bonding, but I just... Um, just been wondering how our debt policy works. So maybe at some point we could, you know, is it a, a maximum amount of debt versus a total grant list, or is it a percentage of our annual budget? Or I just have no idea. So yep. love an update on that. I don't. Yeah, just quickly, um, the commission for uh, recovery and resilience for Montpelier uh, continues to meet. 
on Saturday at two o'clock outside Skinny Pancake. We're doing a little celebration for the um, Youth Conservation Corps um, kids who did so much work to help um, muck out after the floods um, and also celebrating our great parks department and managing that and doing lots of that work too. Um, so hope people can swing by and some of the commissioners will be there. So people just wanna chat and hear more about what's going on. Please come by uh, two o'clock Saturday it's also the cocoa crawl, so you can get some chocolate around town, um, which should be fun. Uh, two o'clock Saturday outside Skinny Pancake. Um, so that should be a nice little celebration. Um, and we are planning a bigger public forum in February. So more details coming soon to share more details about what's going on and finally getting to the point where there's a good, um, more opportunity for public engagement and more people to get involved now that some of the just basic structures are in place. So excited for that. Great, thank you. Um, I uh, I feel like I've been talking a lot tonight, so I can spare you a mayor's report, city clerk's report. Yeah, just a couple things. One of them actually requires some immediate action. That sounds so scary, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> Real quickly, there is the Board of Civil Authority meeting tomorrow night. It shouldn't be a long meeting, but it is a is a big one. We'll probably be making a final decision on national life. So it's it's important, um, as you all already know. I don't have to remind you. I do it every time anyway. Um, but the other thing is we have a uh, petition in for a charter change uh, to, to show up on the next uh, town meeting day ballot. Petitions by charter change are a little weird. The The deadlines and things are a little wonky and they don't line up that well, but it obliges you all as the council to set two public hearings that can only be, I think it's a maximum of 10 days apart from each other. And they have to be warned more than 30 days in advance. They both have to be warned at the same time. Um, they have to be warned twice. It's rather, rather strange, but to make it all work, really, I guess what I'm going to ask you all to do is on to put one of these public hearings on a pre-existing council meeting makes the most sense and the timing is right. If we could have an agenda item for one of these public hearings on the meeting of the 24th of January, to get the second meeting in, we couldn't wait as long as the next council meeting. So I'm proposing it be at the beginning of the board of abatement meeting. So the board of abatement meeting was gonna start at 6.30 then maybe that second hearing could be scheduled for six o'clock that same night. So that would mean setting one meeting for 6.30, the council meeting January 24th, and the second one for six o'clock on February 1st, that following Thursday. Um, sort of playing with the numbers, I wasn't really seeing any other way to, to make it work. So but that, it, that's something you all could would need to call tonight. So does that have to be by February, uh... First, the ballot would already be set, right? Well, the ballot would be set, but it's it's just a hearing for some. Okay, the, the hear, the, so that hearing doesn't affect what goes on the ballot. No, no, it's they've for, already qualified for the ballot. It's so. For the purpose of some people getting information about what it is they'll be voting on. Okay, what's the topic? Oh, the topic. Let me just ask. Uh, it's the um, fair eviction. I forget what they're yeah. calling a just eviction, just cause eviction. Thank you. I have it in front of me and just I can't tell you what, what I'm looking at. Um, yeah, this is something that I guess a few other towns, I know Winooski has passed it and it would em, it would enable the city council to pass um, some ordinance protections for tenants that would largely change how leases work, I guess, without um, to qualify it any further. But I've got a copy of it. I can send it to you. Okay. 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 So Carrie and Donna both had your hands up. Carrie, you first. Um, I'm just worried that uh, half an hour for one of those public hearings won't be enough time. I think there could be a lot of people who want to come out and talk about this. Um, assuming it's a, that's not. <laughs> assuming it's that the people are interpreting the hearing as a an opportunity to give yeah. their opinion rather than get information about it, which I think they probably will. I think people will want to come and give their opinion. So that's my only qualm that and we could just say the first one is really long and the second one is half an hour and that's what we've got. 
Well, the first one would presumably be an agenda item on the right. So it would be as long as it is, I guess. And, and the board of abatement, we can just as we get closer, we could decide to start the board of abatement meeting that night later. Like we can just call it for seven o'clock or call it for when the public hearing ends. Donna. It can't be part of the city council. It has to have its own time ahead of city council. No, no. I mean, it would be like any other of these public hearings we have. It could be an agenda item on the city council. It couldn't be part of the board of civil it couldn't be, it couldn't be part of the board of Well, but on the 24th, you were saying city council. I yeah, think. so they could be like agenda number five or something. Okay. But, um, and just so people are aware, I mean, Jack, because this doesn't really affect me that much, but I mean, I'm not, it's really John's thing, but the 24th is our last night. So that, so we'll be doing public hearings on the budget, the warning, um, and that's when you make your final decisions about what goes on the ballot, presumably any petitions. We do actually, you may remember, we used to have Thursday night meetings. Um, we, John and I talked about that. Um, if there are petitioned items, you do have a, a board of abatement meeting the next night. So we could call a quick council meeting to accept any petitions if we had to add petitions to if they didn't come in, but usually they're in by in advance. They really, you know, I don't know, so come in at the last minute. These are not this one, some other, you know, ballot petition or whatever. Um, so so it will, will be a substantive night that night and actually get more more uh, agenda items to talk about too when it gets to be my turn. And it, it you know, we want to try to keep those Thursdays open for board of abatement meetings. So um, you're saying so this second meeting is is essentially going to be a special council, meeting of the council at council. which the only item might be the public hearing on the charter yeah. proposal. So we need to have a motion to set these two meetings, set these two public hearings. Someone want to make that motion? Carrie makes that motion and we we have the dates and Donna, did you second it, or is there a second? Okay, any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Any opposed? Okay. Thank you all. And are you done? Oh yeah, I'm done. So done. All right, city manager's report. So while we're setting agenda items and meetings, uh, the planning director asked me to bring up uh, scheduling some items, but he's still here. So I'm going to let him explain um, what it was rather than my scribble notes to try to interpret. Um, thanks, Mike. Mike Miller. I wanted to make sure director. I did it. So I didn't uh, I didn't have my list because I thought Bill was going to have I, it, but two zoning, hearings. two zoning hearings and one intro meeting. Oh, yep. One intro. So the planning commission uh, on Monday night, had a public hearing for some zoning amendments. They have forwarded that to you for consideration. I need to warn those in the newspapers uh, 15 days in advance. So I need to kind of figure out what days in your calendar in January. We always try to get them done before any elections. So if we've got them kind of in this window, the last thing we want to do is to have them in February and then vote on them in March because some of you might not be here. New people are going to come in and say, we don't know what's going on. We're not going to vote for the changes. So it's good to, you have to have two hearings. We usually have an introductory hearing just to kind of um, lay everything out. So we're usually looking at three meetings to kind of talk about these zoning amendments. Um, but I don't want to interfere with your budgets. So uh, it really comes down to what you guys are comfortable with for setting up uh, a schedule to kind of have those. So I was thinking the 24th for the hearings would be the 24th and the 14th, um, February 14th. Alternatively. Um... So that way the 28th is available in case you need to go one more meeting, you have one more meeting before town meeting day. So the, the counter to that is you know, Mike and I went around and around about this today is that, you know, you're still finishing your budget too. So you're doing these two things at once. You know, we had, we had, I had on my calendar doing the two public hearings in February, the 14th and 28th, so that the budget was done and you did the zoning hearings after that. But, um, but Mike's right. If you're not ready to approve it by the 28th, then it moves into March. Um, 
the other issue is just doing the introductory meeting to get a sense of what it is. Mike, maybe you can, you know, maybe you can give a quick, real short summary of what it is. Because I don't think this is, you know, I don't know how detailed these things are. That for these, what's these, the the, for what the uh, there are going to be a couple of policy issues. This isn't a really big one. Sometimes we've had ones that for anyone who's been on the council, we've had ones that are we're going to have you know a lot of changes. And there are a lot of changes if you look at the strikeout copy, but the number of policy changes are much smaller than what a lot of times or a lot of the contentious recommendations. So it's really down to um, a couple of changes regarding density, You know, a, a suggestion that we remove density requirements within the di design review district. Um, there are gonna be some policy decisions on whether we expand our, currently if you have a conforming lot, you can have a duplex. There's a recommendation in this one to bring that to four units. Um, and that's just to allow, increase the ability of people to um, better to use their buildings. In some cases, it's more economical to put in four studios than it is to put in two two bedrooms. And that's just makes, gives the flexibility to the property owner to decide. And sometimes density, that density requirement means you have to do two apartments as opposed to four studios. So um, that's a little bit of the recommendations. Those were two of the big ones. There are a lot of changes that are in there that I will go through each one. Some of them are required under the new Home Act. There's a change of state law that's going to affect some things. We don't really get a, a vote on it. Most of it's like this changes to meet state law. Um, so there are a, a handful of these policy decisions that we'll go through. So I don't think, um, obviously, we'll need to hear from the public. We'll hear, need to have questions. So we certainly could, I would think we could get through in two meetings in February, um, because I think either people are going to support them or not support them or make changes to it. Um, if you're not familiar with it, once zoning gets handed to you, it is your document to amend. So if there are things you're like, I don't like that, it's not a matter of voting yes or no. You can say, I'm going to, I would suggest we change this from X to Y, or we don't make this change. So really becomes your document, including, you know, everything and including taking things that weren't recommended and saying, you know, I know there wasn't a recommendation on this provision. This one's always bothered me. I think we should bring that one back and have a discussion on it. So there are all sorts of things we could talk about, but the hope would be that we would have an introductory meeting, or maybe this is the introductory meeting. Um, <laughs> they will all be online. We'll get them all online. Um, but the big thing for me is I've got to warn it in the newspaper and I got to make sure I don't interfere with your schedules because obviously there's going to be a lot of public comment and we don't need one group of people coming in for a zoning public comments and a second group of people of people coming in at the same time to have discussions on the budget. Yeah, this this isn't feeling like, like an easy budget year. I think we could be spending a bunch of work, a bunch of time working on it right up to the end. Um, the density thing is 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 probably reworking that thing that uh, came to us a year or two ago that people thought wasn't necessarily ready for prime time and there was a split on the planning commission. So, so that's been reworked. That's good. So I'm, I'm thinking the 14th and 28th of, Feb of February, I don't know what other people think. Are you doing one as early as the 10th? Yeah. yeah. Okay. No, I <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm just amazed that this is coming at us at this point where we just budget intro tonight, right. doing full board of civil authority with 69 tax appeals plus 20 plus tax abatements. I mean, guys, you're working hard. And I just think bringing this in right now is piling on. I'd, I'd rather move it out a bit and leave time to discuss it. Yeah, I think that's so. The, the reason is that the planning commission has been working on this for a while and they just wrapped it up. So they could have, in theory, gone into February. Um, so they finished their process. So now it comes to us. So the question is, when do we want to schedule this? And I'm, I'm with you. I don't, I don't know that we should do it during budget. So I think if, but if we don't, then the option is you wait until after election and it, you know, it might be the same seven of you. It might not, you know, I don't know who's running, who isn't, who's, you know, so then it's, it's a different thing. So it's really, that's the question. So if you want to get it in for you seven, then really February is the only option. Uh, if you don't want it to conflict with budgets, I think that's so that's 
where we're at. And it's, you know, it's your choice when you take it out. So and you can do it whenever you want, right? I mean, they don't have to, they can wait till March. Yeah. I, February 14th and February 28th. The second. Yeah, Lauren second. Anyone else have everybody okay with that? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed? All right. So we had talked briefly about the fee schedule exemption. I think I'm going to put the hazard mitigation plan on as a consent item coming up. So okay. we can. Okay. Add. But uh, we'll also be making a suggestion for a fee schedule change for building permits. And that, that will deal with um, the energy efficiency. Currently, there's um, an exemption for energy efficiency projects. It's kind of strange. There's a lot of things that do pay fees, but these don't. Um, and we see it's it's somewhat problematic to to use. I can go into the details of it. It's not as simple and straightforward as simply solar panels. It also affect how people pay fees on weatherizing their doing windows and stuff. And so we're we're losing out on a lot of fees we would probably be collecting. And we don't think it actually, we don't think there's anybody not doing energy efficiency work because they won't be able to afford their fees. So we think it's in, in light of the fact that we're trying to come up with money, um, making sure that everybody pays their fees, affordable housing projects pay their fees, a lot of projects pay their fees, but solar panels don't pay fees and energy efficiency work. So we're gonna at least come in and have a conversation with you to see about removing that fee exemption and just having all projects pay fees. And is that going to be part of this package you're coming in with? It'll be it'll separate? be a separate item. It'll be set because it's not really part of the zoning. The fee schedule is separate, but we can have it in that same night. So okay. that will be a, a second item that we'll be bringing forward to you. Great. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Explain that way better. Hmm. Um, the only other thing I have, this is just um, hopefully a tiny little bit of good news. We'll see. Um, we are... For those of you who aren't aware, we had a, a major effort last week with our staff to kind of clear stuff out of the city council chamber and out of the memorial room, in part because I think we're going to move the Justice Center into the memorial room. But we are, uh, I've asked our uh, ADA officials, our folks, to look at whether we could move our meetings back to the council chamber as long as we have the, the hybrid option, um, if that qualifies under ADA is a reasonable accommodation um, because we still have the elevator out. Um, and actually our ADA committee is meeting next Tuesday. So um, we have an ADA committee. We might as well ask them their opinion, have them weigh in on that. So uh, next week we will be at the senior center that's already booked, but possibly starting January, we'll be back on our home field, um, which would be nice. I think just it's easier for everybody, but it, you know, I think we have to, we also have to be sensitive to those that do have accessibility issues and make sure we're doing that. But I do think this format allows for that, but we want to make sure that people that know more about this than me uh, are making that decision. So uh, that's hopefully the new year will bring us back to meeting at city hall. That would be great. I was in city hall meeting with bill the other day. And if you haven't been in city hall in a while, um, Council chamber is not full of stuff piled up on top of each other, furniture and files and boxes and everything. It's it's not back the way it was, but it's not as bad as it was before. So it's encouraging that it's just one little sign of pro progress. And you're done? I'm done. All right. We can adjourn then at 10.03 p.m. Thank you all.